This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Very Hard to Submit. Go to VHTSNY.com and check out their kimonos, compression gear, and apparel. This is a brand we are excited to be supported by. Their gear is high quality with a clean design. Go to VHTSNY.com and see for yourself. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Grab the Union Podcast. On this episode, we have David Porter in studio. Dave is a black belt under Master Pedro Sauer. Enjoy. I need the six minutes. That's what happens in that six minutes. You told me using any technique that works, never to limit myself to one style. Mine. We're not here to take part, we're here to take over. In order to become more peaceful, in order for you to become better, and you can strategize your life. Goodbye, sort of. David Porter. What's up? What's up, man? How's nice it going, to meet man? You. <laughs> Good to see you again. It's been a couple of months now. Yeah, what was it, February when you came out last? Mm hmm. For yeah, a Riley we, seminar. We, yep, me and uh, and my uh, my traveling companion Dan Your Conway, heterosexual life mate. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, no, I, no hetero. I, I didn't have the wife on that last trip. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> had her on the one in uh, in California with Riley. So yeah. um, that didn't go, turn out so well. I got injured out there. So maybe that. So what it. happened to that injury? The best way I can explain it is yeah. I I got a bad case of the John Jones toe. Oh, is that right? Yeah, you remember John Jones versus yeah. Chael Sonnen? When it went sideways? Yeah, yeah, that that, that happened to me. Um, it, it was just like the absolute freakest of freak accidents. Um, I uh, So we went out to uh, to Berkeley. Oh, before you go, by the way, this is Javier. He's filling in for Paul. He's our guest host. <laughs> we didn't even mention that. He just started talking. People got to recognize my voice I, right I would now. assume so. They know. I, I would assume people they who know, know, actually, really people know. People who know, um, know. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Alex uh, Viana. Yeah. Like, as I was listening to him, I'm like, damn, I think he sounds like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, anyhow, so yeah, we were out in Berkeley. We were, we were doing the training camp with Riley focused on, you know, Sambo and, and Riley who Riley body Oh, there also, you go. Now we also got a it. former guest See, of the podcast, <laughs> um, and a good friend of the show. But, uh, so we're out there and, you know, Riley needs to sleep in. He, he, he's not a morning person at okay. all. So like the seminar, the, the camp's not going to start until like noon on Saturday. And I'm like, well, I, I came to California to train, man. So uh, I hit up my friends at, at Gorilla Jiu-Jitsu in Pleasanton. And I'm like, hey, you guys still doing like morning, uh, what do they call them? Uh, marathon, marathon rolls. It's like okay. just an hour nonstop rolling. Um, they're like, yeah, come on down. So I, I drive like, it's like, 45 minutes away from from berkeley drive out there and you know get to roll in and i'm like i don't know maybe three rolls deep with uh with this guy uh and he goes to he goes to shoot a, a takedown on me and i'm like oh i'm gonna crucifix this guy and i think like replaying it in my head i think what happened is i kind of like like my toe didn't get stuck on the mat per se like it wasn't like any problem at the mats or anything like that. Right. Um, but I think like when I went to like sprawl out a little bit, my toe kind of rolled under my own foot. I see. And when he changed angles to try and finish the takedown, my toe went sideways. Ouch. Okay. And I heard like an audible. Yeah. But I still like in that moment, I'm like, oh, my toe hurts. I probably just like stubbed it real bad or something. Right, right. And in the back of my mind, I'm actually thinking, I'm like, I hope I didn't tear the nail off because it was a weird sound, yeah, yeah. you know. So he kind of completes the takedown and he's on top of me getting into side control. And I reach down to grab my foot to see if the nail's still there right. and my hand's wet. I'm like, oh, shit. So I, I like tap him. I'm like, hey, man, I'm, I think I'm bleeding. And uh, he gets off of me and I, I look at my hand and my hand is covered in blood. What just covered. And I'm like, I look down at my toe and my toe is looking at me the wrong way. <sighs> It's pointing at a not quite 90 degree angle relative when it to where it should that. be. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that just oh, terrible? That's the worst. <laughs> yeah, they're only supposed to bend in one direction, right. you know? Uh, so yeah, it, it, had, it had broken on, uh, or not, sorry, it had dislocated at, the, at that first joint there, the, 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 the distal joint. Which toe was it? It's my big toe on my, on my right foot. Um, and in the process of doing so, it had just like 
popped open halfway around right at the joint. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm like, oh, oh shit, I'm hurt. You know, sorry guys. I'm, you know, and I'm like, the guys scramble, they go get me some ice, they get me some paper towels and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, start calling an ambulance before realizing that like the hospital is less than two blocks away okay. and they'll just take me over. Right, right. Um, so they help me into the car, we go to the ER and whatnot. And I guess, I, I didn't realize this, I, I would love to just like claim that I'm like totally calm and savvy in mm-hmm. the moment. But uh, by pure accident of wrapping paper towels around it and like applying pressure so I don't bleed all over the place, yeah. I relocated it. So it went from being like not quite 90 degrees to back to roughly straight just with, you know, just an exploded edge around it. I got yeah. some grody pictures that are not safe for the internet, but okay. prove it <laughs> after the podcast, sir. Those Brent, are, uh, the, the, those are for the Patreon special. Uh, the, the, those guests that give us money, they, they get the extra <laughs> bonus content, right? <laughs> But uh, anyhow, so yeah, spent a whole bunch of time at the ER, like hit up Riley, like, hey man, I I might not make it in time. Can you I pick, might not. <laughs> yeah. Can you, can you pick up Conway? He's like, dude, we're not starting till noon. I'm sure he'll be out of the ER in no time. No, didn't happen. No. But uh, yeah, so the ER doc looks at my toe and is like, okay, yeah, haven't, haven't seen one like that. Um, mm. Sends me in for x-rays and I'm expecting them to be like, oh, your toes, you know, like the bones shattered right. and, and everything. And I look at the x-rays and, and the, the x-ray technician looks at him with me. She's like, you know, I can't officially tell you anything. The doctor has to look at it, you know. And I'm like, well, it doesn't look broken to me. Does it look right. broken to you? And she's like, you know, like in my non-professional opinion, no. Right. And sure enough, the doctor's like, yeah, no, like you've probably torn the tendon partially. Uh. Um but not fully because then she like goes and wiggles my toe to yeah. check the stability. And it's not like just flopping back and forth. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, she like stitches me up. I got like 12 stitches or whatever. It was like, go, you know, stay off of it, which of course I didn't do. Yeah. Um, cause I was on vacation and I had to, had to walk around with the family and whatnot, right. but I didn't train immediately afterwards. It oh, took me, good. took me about two weeks to get back on the mat. Okay. With uh, wrestling shoes. W- Sambo shoes actually. Sambo shoes, yeah. Okay. But uh similar concept. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm back at it. Uh, that was, it, it took me about two weeks to get back onto the mat. I had to wait until the stitches came out before I was comfortable. I didn't want to like tear the stitches. So is that toe me. now compromised? Like, like your fellow Hell no, I put him in a toe hold and you? he was like, he looked eh, at you like nobody Straight down. faced it. Yeah. yeah. yeah First line of defense, right? Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. Straight, straight face. Look face. confident in your defense, even as it's falling apart. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Stone cold. Damn. That's crazy, Hav. Man, yeah, I was, I was, I was displeased with it in the moment. I'm sure, man. It's unfortunate. Uh, truth be told, I made sure I wasn't putting the toehold on that foot. Yeah. But so, for story's <laughs> sake, it sounds way cooler. It does right. sound way cooler. It, David is there not being a total dick about it. And so, in Samba, we we were you know very similar to wrestling shoes. They just have the the soft sole uh, on the bottom. Okay, and. Uh, Riley does this because he's trying to make a fashion statement, mind you. He'll wear one blue and one red shoe. Wait, wait, wait. What kind of fashion statement is that? That he's a crazy guy. I don't know. Like, <laughs> like, just just being different. Okay. Um, But I was like, well, I've got a blue pair of Sambo shoes. I've got a red pair. I'm going to put the red one on the hurt foot and just tell everyone red means stop. There you go. That's clever. <laughs> that so, makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure you do jujitsu? Because that sounds really clever. I, <laughs> Most I, of us are not that smart. Right? I, I'm a grappler, sir. So oh, that's, uh, mm. there it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dave, you're in town for a seminar. I am. I'll be at Team Curran in Crystal Lake on Tuesday night, oh, uh, seven to nine. Nice. This is dropping Tuesday, so um, but it's already probably booked up, right? No, I think there's still space. I mean, Jeff has tons of mat space. Yeah, I mean, uh, Javi, you've trained there with me. You've been up there a few times on your own. It's a reasonably enormous facility. Yeah, yeah. I went up there for his open mat. It was an open mat on some holiday I was up there. Yeah, so there's plenty of space and there's an auxiliary mat off to the side if need be. There's the cage. Mm-hmm. There's also, uh, you know, the locker rooms, the sauna, wherever. I, I'm not here to judge, you know, train wherever you want. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, more importantly... I don't subscribe to doing too much gi gripping. So even though the seminar is going to be in the gi, I told some people, just come. Yeah. Even if you don't own a gi, even if you're a no gi only person, you know, just come train because the techniques I'm going to show you, you can use and they're applicable in either format. 
So I'll be showing some counter guard passing stuff. So when someone tries to pass your guard and you're just like, no, and you make them pay for it or reverse them or whatever it might be. So I'll be sharing some of my tricks on that, which is pretty cool because it's, it's something that I do, but it's not like it stands out compared to the other things I'm more well known for. Okay. And if you watch any of the matches I've had, you'd be like, oh man, that was pretty crazy how he went from there to there. And the end result is where people put their focus, but they sometimes forget the vessel that got you there. Right. So there's a lot of that stuff and I love to show it. And when I was talking to Jeff recently, um, he knew I was coming out here to do all kinds of nerd stuff in the city with my buddies and I was just going to throw something together. Hey, do you want me to come through? Yeah, man, let's do it. What do you want to show? I was like, what do you want me to show? He's like, man, you know, if you built on any of the stuff you showed last time, that would be great. But honestly, these guys love you. They know you got some technical stuff that you just never get a chance to show and they trust you. So right. just don't let them down. I was like, I got you. So I came up with uh, 12 things I want to share. I, I'm very, very uh, critical about mapping out seminars and not just winging it. It's not like I, you know, have my acai bowl and just roll in and be like, oh, here you go. Right. Well, no, do like this. It's, it's very systematic and I've been fine tuning exactly everything down to the delivery, uh, the breaks, the timing, and you have to, you know, manage the clock and it, it's work yeah. and people don't necessarily see that a lot. Um, but professionalism is heavy on me because my military background, um, just being a professional athlete for many, many years, I don't want that to dwindle just because jujitsu as a lifestyle seems like it really applies to the beach bum philosophy. You know, people walking around in shorts and sandals all day. We need that professionalism and we need people to be leaders that others want to emulate and follow. Right. So if I come in and I'm sloppy and then they're like, okay, well that's kind of like par for the course. You get somebody who comes in and not to be like a drill instructor and be very, you know, in your face, but just professional have a very good grasp of the vocabulary of what you're using, right. show your knowledge base, but break it down simple enough to where everyone can understand it and just be present. You know, uh, I've been to seminars in the past. Um, Anthony, you've probably seen them too. Like guy will be on a cell phone in between rounds, like, okay guys, now you drill. And then they go to their phone or they're like looking at something. It's like, come on, man. Right. I paid for your time. Be there. So I'll burn maybe a hundred or 200 calories just walking around to the different groups yeah. and I'm there. And if you have a question, I might not have the absolute answer, but I'll give it my best try and I'll be there for you. So it's going to be a great time. It's one of my favorite places to be. I've been to Jeff's now uh, twice. Uh, I've also just recently came back from a Cocoa Beach retreat that Jeff does. He goes down to do these jujitsu retreats once a year in the winter tries to do a summer session. He did not do one this year because he's relocating his gym. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I have so many great things to say about Jeff. Jeff is one of those, uh, one of those people that inspires me the most within the community uh, because of what he did in fighting more so than his jujitsu. And then later on, as I got more into grappling, I respected that to another level. But as just a fan in the 90s and then early 2000s watching Jeff's career, um, WEC specifically, man, I just – I couldn't get enough of his amount of control over another another human being and his match with uh, Uriah Faber. You know, man, I – it just blows me away when I, when I watch any of his old matches and I still watch them to this day. When he came uh, – when he came to – our academy in May of 2016, we had Master Hicks and Gracie come in. And this was my first time meeting Jeff in that setting. But Jeff doesn't remember that in 2007, we were in Atlantic City. And if you guys may remember, tap out the series mm -hmm. when, uh, you know, Skyscrape Punk Ass and all those guys with tap out crew, they did a reality show for fighters. And uh, it was on Spike TV or Versus or one of, one of them. But they were following one of Jeff's fighters, a guy named Sunshine. And um, the fight was for uh, reality fighting, which is owned by Kip Kohler, Joe Cuff, the Naga guys. And it's their MMA side of their uh, business. I was on that card. 
and I had a losing record and I was fighting another fighter with a losing record. And this was like the make or break for me. Do I really want to keep doing MMA professionally? And I remember going to the weigh-ins and seeing Jeff Curran and being like fanboy status. Like, oh my God, it's Jeff Curran. <laughs> Big frog, what's up? Like, I didn't, com- I didn't go up to him like that, but that's all what's going in my head. And I just went, man, I got to say something. I walk up to him. Hey, Jeff, how's it going? He's like, it's good. And then he just like went on with his day. <laughs> and he didn't mean, it, it's not like I felt blown off because right. I was like, oh my God, he talked to me. Like that's, that was my reaction. But I also knew that he was under a lot of duress because he's there to coach, it, coach and corner his fighter. I've got trainers with me. They, they don't want to be bothered. The fighters don't want to be bothered. So it was like, I just wanted to kind of be like a blip on his radar for that second. And then I also saw the film crew following them around and that could not have been easy on him. So I completely understand but then training backstage and um, you know seeing him work some pads with Sunshine and seeing him do some other stuff. And I was like, man, this is a great experience. This is what I thought my professional MMA career was going to be. Like I'd be surrounded by the guys that I idolized and I would be, be at that level and be immersed in that lifestyle. And then you know I go out. Um, I think everybody – I never got to see the scorecard, but I'm pretty sure I won the first round handedly. You know, I, I landed a head kick that split my opponent's jaw like – like from uh, cheek to chin because he was open mouth from a, me Ooh. breaking his nose. And then I had kicked him right on the jaw and his teeth, he uh, cut through his cheek because he only wore like a top row mouth guard. Yeah. Right. So the bottom row was exposed. Wow. So now he's bleeding everywhere. And then as fast as I'm throwing out my jab and pulling it back, the blood is on my glove, then spraying off of my glove over my shoulder, giving me these crazy like bloody tiger stripes. <laughs> and I mean, I took him down with a double leg, pounded him out. And I was like, sweet, round one in the bag come out round two and I just get tossed on my butt from a clinch because I'm a little arrogant and he pounds me a few bit a little bit in the face the ref stops the match and I'm like did that just happen wow and I'm like man I look so bad in front of Jeff Curran <laughs> fast forward nine years we're at the Hickson seminar uh at Master Sowers headquarters you know and he's one of Master Sowers um students from the from the old days and I go up to him and I'm like, Jeff, I, I've been a fan of yours forever. You probably don't remember bumping into me. He's like, nope. <laughs> I was like, oh, thank God. And once again, like, it's not, I never got annoyed by that. I was like, oh, thank God he forgot. Like I got my ass kicked that night. Yeah. But, you know, we ended up training that night. And what was crazy was um, Master Sauer is really humble about himself, but loves to talk highly of his students. Okay. And if you're one of his students that happens to be like, exceptional or you do a little bit more like you get a little bit more of that of that time of his when he's when he's going through his uh his talks about you know oh look look out for this guy they're really good you know he'll give you a little bit more love and that particular day he had said something about my leg lock game and said something maybe about my arm and choke game and it it, it kept coming up and it was like cyclical throughout the the seminar that night so later on when jeff was training uh we were all training but you know, there was like a queue lined up for Jeff and I was, I was looking around and he sees me in the crowd and he's like, he waves me over. Wow. And I thought that was awesome. And then we finally got to train and it was great, man. I mean, <laughs> top 10 best roles I ever had in my life. Wow. Competition or otherwise. And it was with Jeff Curran. I was like, man, nice. this is a, this is a dream come true. We hit it off that weekend. And then, uh, subsequently like, you know, I ended up getting my, my black belt that summer did a few higher level tournaments and uh, super fights. I asked Jeff for some help on some things. And then he came back out, taught a seminar. Um, we stuck around and trained for a bit. And then when he had that fight to win pro match against Kai Otera, yeah. you know, he asked me if I would help him out. Uh, what people don't know is originally he was supposed to have a match with Eddie Cummings. Mm. That match fell through. Uh, I can't remember the exact reason, so I'm not going to speculate since my, I don't want to use a faulty memory. But it was originally going to be Eddie. And within our association, Jeff is – or sorry, let me back that up. Jeff is really fond of working within. He will go outside of the association if he has to. But if he knows that there's talent within, why not? Right. So the the real like cementing of the deal, as it were, with our relationship was when he reached out to me to help him with some some entanglements from the legs – because he knew he had a match against Eddie. And I had previously had matches with uh, two matches with Gordon Ryan, uh, two matches with Oliver Taza and uh, Stanley Rosa. 
I mean, so many of those Henzo guys, right, right. he's like, man, you have the most experience with them. Right. Now, for full transparency, lost every single one of them. <laughs> right. But my first match with Taza, you know, we, we went back and forth and it was a great trade. And at least people that point forward understood that it's like, I know this stuff. Right. They're just better. But, you know, Jeff understood that at least the experience was there mm -hmm. and I can give him the looks and we set up a date to play. So when we're getting closer to our play date, that's when the curveball was thrown and Eddie pulls out for whatever the reason was and they replaced him with Kyle. Now that's a different animal. Completely. I have nothing in common with Kyle Terra in terms of game, right. right? Maybe the closest we get is like reverse De La Hiva style game because I do like to play that a bit. But I mean, the, the, the match went from a no-gi match against Eddie Cummings to a gi match with Kyle. And so Jeff had already planned to come out and he's looking forward to a good camp. And as one of the more avid competitors in the association, at least he knows I understand what a camp should be. He right. won't get hurt and things will be great. Right. Now, Jeff's not one to make excuses and nobody really heard it from him up to this point outside of what I'm about to say, which is Jeff got hurt really bad right before the match came out and did the camp injured Ugh. and like we it was touch and go it was like man should you even do this and we were like taking it day by day so i will say this like i learned so much about kayo from that camp because we were watching footage and we're trying to replicate and it was a lot of monkey see monkey do and although i have a, a decent working knowledge of all jujitsu it's like what he's doing he's a specialist at yeah. i cannot be that on short notice but we did our best and uh, with the help of Chris Beverly and um, Kyle Perkins, some of the other guys from Team Kern who came out for that road trip, you know, Joey Deal was helping out as much as he could at that time. And we put together a stellar camp with an injured competitor and it ended up being a great match. But, you know, Jeff will tell you, it's just one of those things where his injury didn't come into play. He made no excuses. He just zigged when he should have zag, got armbarred, and that was that. But man... You go and you step up against Kayo on short notice. Right. And, you know, I'm pretty sure the match was at 145 or maybe even 150. And Jeff still had to cut. He had that injury, all this other stuff. The camp was thrown together. And, you know, he, he had a competitive match against Kayo. Like, I, I think it was great. No, it was a good match. We were, we were there live. Yeah. Oh, you saw it live. Yeah. That's yeah, right. Because yeah. it was. It was, at the was yeah. Here in I Villa Park. Yeah, it was in Villa Park. Yeah. That was a good match. I mean, that was that the card was pretty good. The whole card was good. Yeah. yeah. Now, you know, I still would love to have seen what the camp would have been like if we had done more leg entanglements and exchanges. And then Jeff's game being what it is and Eddie's being what it is. Well, what do you think about like him taking that match, you know, being injured or, or not being able to do it? What do you think about it? Just in, not Jeff per se, but just that whole idea of. You have an injury, you have an obligation, you don't want to call, but you know, should you? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's that battle so, that all all competitors have to yeah, go absolutely. through. Absolutely. Yeah. Today I was competing and I'm like, oh, should I my knees messed up? Should yeah. I I did it anyway, regardless, because I just I love to compete. But what do you think about it? like how how does that play into so many people? We're friggin' weirdos, man. Like a normal person walks up to the friend, like, oh man, how's the wife? How's the kids? You know, jujitsu people, grapplers were like, oh man, how's the knee? How's the shoulder? Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, like we're always messed up. <laughs> always. Like uh, out of the 240 matches I've had, right? I think I was 100% for one of them. Yeah. And I probably got injured in that match. And that was the <laughs> domino effect. Like. When I can't you, remember the last time I was truly 100%. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, you're in varying stages of disrepair because in order to train this art, you're in the meat grinder. Yeah. You're constantly being folded up. And if you are the best person in your academy and you're steamrolling everybody, you're not challenging yourself and you're not growing. And then how good are you? If I'm working with a white belt, blue belt, doesn't matter. I'll put them on my back. They're dangerous. A white belt on your back is dangerous, right? right? right. Like all of my weapons are facing the wrong way. I will get good training. You can positionally make it better for yourself, but the risk of injury goes up. Like yeah. you let yourself get put into a deep ankle lock with a blue belt. 
and you're like, hey, I know your ankle lock sucks and you'll probably never get there in a million years, but if I put myself in it, now I've made the training harder on myself and therefore I will grow. But now the risk of injury goes up. And if you're not in that pocket every every time you're training, that's not bad, but you know, you gotta you gotta at least get in there to know what it's like yeah. so that when it happens, you're not freaking out. But because of that, the wear and tear builds up, you go in, it's like, man, if you're 90%, you're competition ready. Right. And if you're sub 90%, well, hope and bubble gum will go a long way, right? <laughs> you're just held together with hope and bubble gum. You're gonna do it. My first match with Oliver Taza. I go in with a knee brace on with a leg that had been uh, uh, recently bowed out from a bad takedown. I took the match on eight days notice and there was no way I was saying no to it. And that was my most competitive match with him. Wow. And it's just like your focus, your focus will help your resolve and it'll sharpen your moves and you'll go in there and you'll do great. Um, the more skilled person will typically win if, if they get to their spots and you know, he did and it was, it was excellent execution. When we grappled again in uh, like six, seven months later at the Jiu Jitsu Kumite, when I first met Javier uh, face to face, you know, that day I kind of steamrolled my bracket. And then I had what is arguably one of my hardest fought matches to date, which was against Elliot, Elliot Hill. Who was a fellow R Dojo teammate. Yeah. And I was on the cusp of joining the team prior to that. And we, Riley and I had been in talks. And then it just so happened that Elliot and I, uh, let me back up for a second. There were four, four man brackets or four man pods. And the way it worked was every person within had a round robin against the other three. Okay. Best record moves on to a final four person pod. Got it. Winner of that wins all the monies and the glory. Hurrah. Well, uh, Taza destroys his bracket. There was one upset in another bracket where, um, this guy, Hunter Colvin, who's out of, uh, tr Triton. Triton. Yeah. Um, trains with James Partridge, Pete Wilhelm, that, that crew, you know, he, he beat Chase Hanna and that was like, I, I didn't necessarily see that coming. I thought, I thought Chase had him and I thought Chase was going to move on to the next one, but, uh, this guy moves on. Taza steamrolls his one and then Elliot goes through his and Elliot had a killer match against Jams, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just one of the coolest matches I had seen that day. Not, not, I mean, just like period from either division. Like that match was killer. And I'm like, crap, I got to go up against this guy. And that was my first match. And I took everything super seriously. And eventually like, the, the final leg entanglement came down to who gave the less fucks. He had me, I had him, and whoever just went through it the deepest, like, that person would win. Like, if you can just deal with it the longer or if your body could hold out. Because eventually right. what happened was there was a snap. And um, I never did find out what happened, but I knew he was on crutches and I know his dad's a doctor. I know he ended up making a full recovery. Yeah. He yes. went on to win against Tom Lee and... um fight to win pro like he's much better now but right. man it was scary really? it, it, it was a hellacious like 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 wet one of those celery celery like, cracking oh, yeah, yeah, type. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Like, like heel hook, heel heel hook. Yep. yeah um and uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna chime in on this so uh you know like i know a bunch of the guys that are competing down at the kumide um elliot didn't have anyone really in his corner per se. I'm like the worst corner man in the world. We've talked about this in the past. Yeah. So I'm not cornering him or anything, but I'm watching, you know, intently. I'm like, Ugh, you know, biting my nails on this match. And uh, that injury happens. And I'm like, oh, fuck, man. And uh, there's a couch. We sort of, we, we, we limp him over to the couch and uh, we're talking to him and, he, and he's like, man, I... Uh, I think I'm okay. <laughs> I'm like, the, the fuck you are. Yeah. It was like, it, <laughs> to, to give you an idea, it's like, um, I, I don't know the exact name of the people in the, in the special effects injury uh, industry that make the sound effects. Yeah, yeah. They can't do it justice. Right. Like the, the sound is so like gut wrenching. Yeah. Like everybody. Now you have like some of the best, um, 170 pound leg lockers around, 
coming to Houston for this money. And like to see Oliver Taza's face when he heard that snap. Now this is a guy who snaps legs, yeah, right? Yeah. And to see his face and Nikki Ryan was there and Nikki Ryan is just like, Ooh, you know, like yeah. right. it was bad. Um, I've refereed almost 3000 matches for us grappling for the good fight for a few other organizations. And I've seen some injuries on the mat. I've seen um, a tib fib break in a, in a lock wasn't even that bad. Like the <laughs> sound wise, the sound wise, right, right, right. right. Um, shoulders popping wrists, anything you can imagine this, I'm the one doing it. And right. I freak out. I'm like, wow. Ooh, uh, you just let go right away. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was just, well, first off that was the, that was the, and I hate to say this pun, but that was the make or break moment for the match. Yeah. He had me, I had him, and it was a matter of, like I said- Dual heel hooks on? Is that uh, what was going kind on? of. What was like, the position? He, I, I knew that as I turned the corner, he was going to make his perfect catch. I see. So I need to go through faster, deeper. Okay. Otherwise, I'm done. Because the way I was, the way I was sitting um, inside over under triangled, and as I turned the corner, he had sat over my foot, and now my foot was going to be right in that pocket. I was like, uh-oh. And he's better at it than I am. So- don't let the person better than you at the position get there and Before, then race. Right, right, right. If anything, I need that head start. Yeah. So when when I turned the corner, I was like, here goes nothing. And it was that Hail Mary. And then when it went, oh, man, like I didn't move. I was like paralytic with fear yeah. because I just crippled a dude is what I'm thinking in my head. Yeah, yeah. Nothing good will come of that. That's not something where you're like, no, nah, just walk it off. I'm good. Yeah, I know. And then- because that MFer wants to come back and finish the four person bracket, I'm like, dude, Taza, Taza beat Hunter. I beat him. Unless I beat Taza, he beats Hunter. Like, and then we force like a three way where it's like, right. okay, now we all have the same number of losses or wins. Like, or sorry, if I go on and beat Taza, I win point blank. Right. And then if Taza beats me, like he'll probably go on and win. Right. Like that, that was the dynamic. So there was really nothing worth him coming back on the mat for. And he still wanted to. Right. Wow. No, I, I, I'm, I'm with Elliot and his dad's there as well, mind you. And, uh, I'm like, you know, I'm, you're a grown ass man. Right. You know, you, you, you make your decisions, but I'm like, listen, man, you don't really have a shot at winning the money right now. Like if everything lines up perfectly, maybe it could happen. Yeah. So if you do this, you're just doing this for like the glory of it, for right. the cool story to tell, you know, a couple of years from now about how, you know, you got your leg practically broken and whatnot. And I'm like, and I, I've realized as I'm telling him this, I've said the wrong thing because he's like, oh man, it would be a cool story. Oh, he doesn't say this out loud. But <laughs> his eyes light up. <laughs> yeah. and, and his dad's like, I don't think you should do this. Well, as we're trying to talk him out of this and he's, trying to like hype himself up that yeah. no, no, I can do this. Dad's phone rings. Picks it up. Hands it to Elliot. It's your mother. She was watching Damn. live on Facebook. Trump card. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. She heard that. Wow. Damn you, Facebook live. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that is why Elliot Hill did not go back into that match. Wow. Because thanks, mom. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you from all of us. So what was we the did, yeah. what would it end up? What was the? I don't know. To oh, this day, uh, okay. and and that's the thing. Like no animosity. Like yeah. I don't I don't dislike him. In fact, I follow him crazy like crazy now. Yeah. But um, we're we're just not we're just not cool on that level. And uh, when I did see Riley back in February, the topic came up, and he's like, "No, nah, it's good." And that was about as far as it went before we like started firing Nerf guns at each other. Because um, that's like how Riley that's how Riley do. Okay. Um, but yeah, what? no, he was, I mean, it was a louder, more devastating sounding injury than it ultimately ended up being from what I understand. I see. Um, but yeah, that, like that was a room full of dudes cringing audibly. On and not video. just dudes. Like I said, like guys who have been there and right. pop some ankles, pop some knees and they're just like, Bleh. yeah, we, we all thought he was done. Like we, we yeah. So long story short, between the exhaustion of having those four matches leading up to that, um, the, the exhaustion of leading up to that, then that match, you know, it's really hard to train hard and then take a long break, get cold and get back into yeah. training. Well, it didn't necessarily have that big of an effect in terms of like slowing down the process because 
we still ended up having uh, another match. And then I then they made a short break to see if Elliot would come back. He didn't. Then we started the next match. And then I lost to Taza. The, the real thing that killed me in that match with Taza was I'm mentally off my game now. I'm like, okay. man, first opponent, Josh Edelston. Awesome dude, 10th Planet guy um, out of the Gulf Shore area. Trains with Sean Applegate. Uh, probably even lankier than I am. And I knew that would be my hardest match in my bracket. We had to go up against each other first. And that turned into a crazy leg lock battle. And there was a, um, a compression on the knee with a special lock that I like to do. And it popped his knee. And that was my first match of the day. Yeah. Then my next match, um, pardon me, but... I don't remember my other two opponents' names in that bracket. Okay. They were um, they were last minute fill ins, and to be perfectly fair, like the the other guy in that bracket was not um, so much an avid g- grappler so much as he was like an amateur MMA fighter. I see. But Josh had beaten the one guy pretty easily with a heel hook, and so uh, oh no, sorry, I apologize. I'm only thinking about that other guy. He uh, ankle locked that guy, and then I ankle locked that guy. And then I had a match with, um, oh man, another guy from Triton. Why can't I think? Um, who else? Man, it's going to kill me that I can't remember his name. Great kid, but um, definitely yeah. undersized I, for the I bracket. I can see him in, okay. yeah, I can see him in my mind. Blonde hair, can't. God, it's going to kill me. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't bring my phone in studio because that's rude. But uh, anyway, kid was definitely undersized for the bracket. And I just remember, like, I stepped on the scale the night before at 170. And then like that morning, I was like, please, God, let me still be 170. <laughs> and then like I step on the scale and they're like, awesome. I've got like five hours. And I probably was like 185, like five hours later, because my body is like a wrung out sponge and just absorbed everything. Yeah. And I'm looking at this guy like, man, I don't even think I'm big enough to be going up against Josh Yelveston. And then here's this kid. And he tried some like knee shield flippy kind of sweep. And I just like bore into it and it popped his hip yeah. jesus it's like man you're dealing with some big dudes and you're trying to like do do this move and it it hurt him and i was like man two guys in a row and then you know josh popped the other guy's ankle and then i like you know he loosened the jar and then i did the rest and then that guy hobbles off and then elliot so now i'm mentally in like man four dudes are going to be right. going to some kind of aftercare following yeah. this or at least having a date with ben gay and now I got to go up against Taza and I'm just mentally like, I'm done. I checked out. Jeez. And he, he gets me in like the loosest reverse triangle. And I had had a shoulder injury that I was nursing. And it's like mentally, if you're, if you're in it and you're focused, you're just like, ah, whatever. But at that moment I was like, I've seen too many people get hurt today. Yeah. And so I feel a little bit of discomfort and I tapped and he looks at me like, did I just really win this money with that? Right. Like the move <laughs> wasn't good enough in his mind. Like Taz is like, dude. And we went out to dinner afterwards, by yeah. the way, like all of us, uh, Javier can tell you, it was like Nikki Ryan, me, John Calistine, uh, Ethan Krellenston, like a fucking murderer's row of people <laughs> right. are, are, at this are, local are, Texas are eating, barbecue. Elect, uh, are eating like Texas barbecue. Like we're all best friends. Meanwhile, we just simulated murder in swimwear. Right. right. And, um, and <laughs> for the record, several of us had basically just met that day. Yeah. It was yeah. just, yeah. But that's the community when it's at its core, like, even the top, top guys shouldn't have animosity after the match. Sure. Of course. No, unless you're Dylan Dennis. Yeah. <laughs> or AJ. Yeah, those two. Huh? F well, those guys. When you, when you actively work to build animosity, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Posers. Yeah. What are they going to do? Beat me up? So point being, like, we, we all go out to dinner and, like, <laughs> Taz is so funny. He's like, man, I, I didn't think that move was that good. <laughs> I was like, well, you know, like, mentally, I was just on tilt, like, poker terminology. I'm thinking, like, all these guys that I grappled are getting hurt because they should have probably tapped early or just not tried whatever move or whatever have you. Yeah. And now I'm thinking I came in with a minor injury. Like, like I said, we all go in injured, but it, it just like it, it messed with my core yeah. where I didn't want to risk it now. Whereas like later on that night, we're out at dinner. I was like, yeah, you're right. That was a shitty move. Like, why did <laughs> I tap to that? But realistically, it just messed with me seeing all these guys get injured. And I was like, I've always been taught tap early, tap often. Right. I've been putting so many dumb moves where I was like, I'll regret this later. Yeah. This time, instead of being like, I'll regret this later for a friggin' medal, like what is a medal? It doesn't feed you. This right. was for like real money. And I, and I didn't do it. And I don't 
I don't, I have a love hate relationship. Like I don't regret the tap so much as like the mindset, man, I needed to be more focused. And in that moment, mm -hmm. it is a fight. Things will hurt. Would I have been hurt more or injured? So like, I'm really big on word choice. Right. So in this case, could it have hurt me? Yeah. A lot of things hurt. Right. Like even just like getting a hard sweep or a takedown, it initially hurts, but did it injure you? Right. I think my thought process made every little thing hypersensitive to injury now because of all the injuries up to that point. Right. So I'm more mad at that than the after effect of losing. You know, it's like, man, would it have just hurt me? Right. So, you know, there's so much that goes into go whether you compete hurt or not. You have to own that and you have to make that decision of where you draw the line at how far you'll go. Are, is your line only going to stop? Is your line going to start, you know, at I will step on the mat at 90% plus. Okay. That's a good start. That's right. like most of us. Does it stop, aka when you tap, when you're hurt or when you're approaching red line injury? Some of us tap like way before anything. Like we don't, don't even know the threat well enough. So we tap to the unknown. Yeah. But a lot of well-versed veterans are going to be like, I know what injured looks like and I'll tap a hair before that. Right. So, you know, that that's kind of like the long story on competing injured or what the mentality is and how that yeah. can change in the tournament. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Man, are you going through any injuries right now? <laughs> My knee popped how many times today? <laughs> Eight. Eight oh, times. Shit. Yeah. So I was rock climbing, came off the uh, bouldering wall, landed correctly in terms of how you should land both feet at the same time. Okay. But the mat itself was not uh, equal firmness. So uh -huh. where my left foot landed, it was squishier. So that foot got depressed and it was firmer under my right leg. So then that knee buckles as my weight is trying to find equilibrium. Of course. And it blows out my meniscus and partially tears my ACL. The good news is my ACL will recover in no time um, through uh, stem cell injection and some other fancy fangled dangled uh, black magic. But the meniscus right now is like in this precarious state of loving to flip over inside my knee. And then it'll lock out my knee and then I have to stretch it and then it pops back over and you'll hear the click. And so, you know, I'm rolling with all these killers today at 10th Planet Chicago and we're having fun. But there, there were two of the eight times it popped, it was like, this is more serious than the others. Right. Like if I'm doing a movement of my own free will and it's a small pop, it's like, okay, it feels almost like you, you crack a knuckle, crack a knuckle. Yeah. that was a little resistant to being cracked. Like you felt like as you're doing it, like, ah, okay, and I'll keep going. And then you do it and it pops. And then there's that release. That's how most of them were. And then there's that time you crack your knuckle and then your knuckle like says you're a jerk. Right. <laughs> That's what happened on those other two occasions. And I was like, you know, I probably could have been smarter about this, but I wasn't. And I made that line. I said, I'm going to train at sub 90% today right. with a bunch of guys that I know, know what they're doing and have a proclivity for leg entanglements and fighting out of, you know, body lock triangles, triangle chokes and all this stuff. Okay. I will bail the things I can. I will maintain the things I can. And I'll, I'll play around that gray area when it comes to it. But man, yeah, like going in today with that knee injury was probably not smart, but I am not more injured leaving than I was when I entered. Right. Okay. So ultimately, not, not something I would recommend unless you are very aware of your body. You know the demographic or the, the, the people you're dealing with, and you know that they have your best interests at heart. Nobody kept going when my knee popped. Okay. Like everybody would be like, oh, is that okay? I'd be like, yeah, it's okay. Right. And then we'd keep going. Right. Nobody wrenched like a heel hook. And if I said specifically, hey, or, or uh, in one case, um, this guy Willie comes up to me and he had already seen my knee being adjusted at one point. It's like, you sure you're good? I'm like, yeah. And then he's in the middle of a movement. He's like, wait, is that your bad leg? Yeah, I'll switch sides. They have my best interests at of heart. Course. It's of course. not like they need to win the drill. Right. I, I walked in, I didn't see a podium, so I'm just guessing like nobody- We keep it downstairs. You keep it downstairs. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. That's the running joke at my academy. We've got this guy, uh, Dominic Mern, and Dominic, um, he's like our, 
our resident, um, I don't know how to explain it, like most trusted go-to guy. Okay. So it's like, you need something done, you go to Dom. Dom's 21 years old, he's in shape, he can handle it. It's like, move this, get that, take care of this, cover this class. Like, he'll do it. And he's full of piss and vinegar. Well, <laughs> because we know we can like lean on Dom for much, I keep saying, hey Dom, when are you gonna build that podium? And he's like, I'm right on top of that. And you know, like with the same amount of vigor, right. I'm right on top of that. Well, now the, the that the joke's gone on long enough, I just look at Dom, I'm like, Dom, you didn't build the podium, did you? He's like, no. Guys, why are we still doing this? We know Dom didn't finish his, his job. <laughs> you shouldn't be trying to win the drill. <laughs> but you know, it, and it's funny too, I wanna, I wanna say something. When you have a mixed room of people at any academy, uh-huh. And you have competitors in the mix. They can be looked at as the boogeyman. But ain't it a bitch that it's not those guys typically hurting people. It's the guys who don't compete that use that platform as their competition. That, yeah, that's that's where they get that aggression out. Oh, I beat the guy. Right. And it's like, mm, where was the ref? Like, right. You know, and, and for the record, I'm just going to say, screw those guys. That's not what they're there for. Like, you, it's not, you shouldn't be competing with the guys in your academy. You should be competing with yourself. You should be better than you the day before. Right. You should be the best you you can be. You should be hitting the moves you sucked at last week. But if it's like, man, I haven't, I haven't beaten person X. Today, X is going to get it, right? Now all I can think of, X going to give it to you. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Sorry. No, I, I, I was thinking the same thing. Damn it. I, I somehow blame Deadpool for bringing DMX back into my back into my mind. That was a good Deadpool though. The, the second one. I mean, they're both. I love both of them. Listen, yeah. it didn't suck. It didn't suck. And you know, say what you will, but I hope they don't mix Deadpool into the the, the MCU. I think he's doing just fine on his own. Yeah. I love all the all the little jabs at the split between the studios. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love the jabs at the other movies that did suck. Right. Man, it's super keep, clever. Keep it the way it is. Yeah. So uh, we haven't had a chance to talk about this yet, but it's uh, it's important to me and probably I've most loved of the you since the moment I met you. There you go. Oh, wait, different thing? Okay. <laughs> different okay, thing, okay. but go ahead, thank Javi. you for the confirmation go of what ahead. I already <laughs> knew in my heart. <laughs> you said it with your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you feel about the uh, the representation of your favorite X-Men in film, finally, after all these years. So for those of you that don't know, I love cable, and this is kind of something that is going to give me so much judgment from the comic nerds everywhere. Um, mainly because if you like anything drawn by Rob Liefeld, you're like looked at as a poser. Um, if you don't know, every, every mutant X-Men spinoff person who had pouches – unnecessary pouches on their on their rigging <laughs> and uh, a glowing eye of some kind you know they're looked down on it's it's just like i get it the comics you grew up with are now different so ugh, change but man when i was reading comics that was the era and i loved cable i thought cable was a badass first off he didn't look like a fit man in his prime he was like battle hardened. He had gray hair and scars on his face. Yes, he was a massive human being by scale to other people, but you know, they're comics. When is anything to scale? Right. So the more I read his the more I read into it, like his backstory and you know, got to know that character, I was like, man, he's like the mutant messiah, but then had a bunch of shit happen to him and has like these inhibitors on his powers. So if you don't know, like he has the genetic material available that gives him almost unlimited potential, but has a virus that is literally going to eat his body if he uses his powers for anything other than keeping those the, that virus at bay. So the metal arm is actually an organic compound that will slowly creep to his internal organs and then eventually kill him. And he is a telepath, uh, a telekinetic rather, moving things with his thought, he's a telekinetic of the highest order that at the molecular level, he is using that power to physically push that virus away from his organs. And if he tries to use those powers, it creeps in further. So he is on a borrowed time every time he goes out and operates. 
And even in like the issue where he beats the Hulk, how many heroes have beaten the Hulk? Oh yeah, that's right. A handful. Cool. Just checking because in case any comic nerds out there want to pull my card, I'll be like, oh yeah, the Hulk. Yeah. Fuck that guy. So, (laughs) um, cable is cable is awesome. Right. So hate him for his appearance, hate him for the era he came out, but man, like he's got a killer story and he's destined to take out apocalypse the first and arguably one of the more powerful mutants. And this guy like body jumps from body to body through, through time. And they alluded to that in the terrible, terrible apocalypse movie. But what people don't know is like cable eventually has a family and has a son and in Deadpool, they didn't really do it well, but whatever, like he can have a daughter. I don't care. Like (laughs) timelines or whatever in Marvel, but you know, in the comics, he had a son, Tyler, he was training him. He was so proud of him. Apocalypse takes his son and then body jumps into him. And now Cable eventually gets to that final battle with Apocalypse where he knows he will die. He will die when he has to fight Apocalypse. He's going to have to use all of his powers to kill this guy. But now it's in the body of his son. So now you have this like Richard Matheson-esque showdown. And if you don't know Richard Matheson, well, you're wrong. (laughs) But um, best suspense writer of the 20th century. Any good Twilight Zone episode written by Richard Matheson. So like everybody usually knows like Terror at 30,000 Feet with the Gremlin on the plane with Shatner. Uh-huh. Like that was written by Matheson. Um, that was a good one. If yeah. you, if you yeah. ever read the book, I am legend, you know that it shits on all three movies that were made by the, the, the proxy of it. Like the Will Smith movie was terrible. Um, Omega man with Charlton Heston was terrible. Last man on earth with Vincent price was terrible. They've tried that book three times. They're right, all right. bam. They all bomb. Yes. But the book is amazing. Um, what dreams may come stir of echoes. You name a good thriller movie. Richard Matheson wrote the book. Nice. So in, uh, in the original, I am legend, the book, you know, his family dies and then they come back and then the main character has to kill his wife and kid. Oh, wow. And it's way more trippy in the book than in any of those shitty movies. So very similar, like, and that's why I say Richard Matheson-esque, Cable has to kill his son vis-a-vis Apocalypse and then ultimately dies in the battle that will help usher in a more peaceful, non-Apocalypse present future. So yeah, I fucking love Cable. And Josh Brolin nailed it (laughs) like i don't think people understood like how good he was in that movie because all they're thinking is hey that's the voice of thanos (laughs) and i'm like dude it's brad from goonies like exactly that's what i was thinking (laughs) that's because you're old yes but so am i (laughs) when push came to shove brad got on that little girl's bike and pedaled his happy ass down hill (laughs) brad went to work like (laughs) brad got shit done and you know what gotta say it Cable got shit done. And <laughs> Deadpool is hilarious. Cable had his like little two, three lines of funny. But for the most part, he progressed the story and he did cable shit. That's all I care about. Right. And he did it in such a way that made him kind of like the asshole, but endearing. And that's what we, as people who loved X Force, like, you know, the bad X Men who did like the dark ops, that's what we cared about. It's like, just get it done. Right. And if anything, and especially if Riley ever listens to this, like I'll make sure he does. Oh, please. I, I love the fact that they alluded to Shatterstar or not alluded. They actually had <laughs> yeah, him, right? They had and they had some other characters and then they fucking wiped them out <laughs> in like vicious form. And it was so cool because, uh, even, even down to like Shatterstar having alien blood and it was purple and green, you know, green. It was green. I think it was green. Well, it doesn't matter. Huh. It, was def- it was different. Whatever it was, it was different. I might have walked into that movie with a concussion. <laughs> <laughs> is there 90%, a good story? 90% is all I ask. <laughs> is there a good story behind that? <laughs> yeah, probably. I block with my face. But, you know, um, Shatterstar was another one of those characters where it was like, oh my God, all the pouches and the crazy hair. And it's like, man, they murked him ridiculously. Like falling into the helicopter. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it was just... Deadpool 2 was good. I don't think it was... I, I mean, it was it was hilarious. I loved it. It was stupid. You shouldn't have any other expectation when you go to a Deadpool movie. Like, did you walk into the wrong movie? I had a friend who walked out of the first Deadpool. What? Yeah, we're currently not really on the best of terms when we talk about being friends now. Of course not. How could <laughs> because you be? of Deadpool? Well, it's just like, man... <laughs> I don't want to get into dating advice, but it's like you see some haggard person and you pick them up. You're like, I'm going to turn this person around. No, you're not. <laughs> you, What you see is what you get for the most part. It's like 
Did you not see any of the advertising for this movie? Did you not know what you were getting involved in? You walked out of the movie. Oh, so dumb and cheesy. I was like, dude, I wanted dumb and cheesy. I saw the previews. Exactly. It's usually the other way around. You see a preview and it short changes or oversells what you think it's going to be. You go and you're like, it's nothing like what I thought. Yeah, that movie sucked. That that Hereditary. Did you see that one? No, I didn't see that one. Yeah. That was so disappointing. (sighs) Fuck, that was... I was like, I thought that was going to be like the one. No. But man, that was terrible. Well, that's what happens when you like... Zig when you should have zagged. Yeah. Um, but you know, the break, the breakaway performance in Deadpool two to me was uh domino. Mm-hmm. I was not a fan of the casting choice. Cause I was like, that doesn't look anything like the comic domino. All right. It's actually but, the inversion of domino. Who's yeah. Like in the comic super pale. Yeah. She's, she's albino except for the one black spot around her eye basically. Uh-huh. And in, in the movie, uh, it's a, a black girl who's got a what the hell is that condition called? I don't know. Like, but yeah, Michael got, Jackson. A, yeah, like fake disorder. Right. <laughs> she's got the white spot around. Michael her Jackson right, really right, didn't right. have yeah. that disorder. Um, That's called bleach. Right. <laughs> what is he going to do? Fight me? It's true. Probably not. Probably not. I, I would give you pretty good odds in that fight too. Yeah, but you know, Domino in that flick. You know, she really represented herself well, and I loved how they played out her luck. You're right. And. You know, for any comic nerds listening, if you don't know it, her luck is actually not luck. It's a form of, it's a form of telekinesis that like uh, my buddy Jeremy was talking about his reptilian brain telling him he's hungry again. Well, we have like different levels of our brain that we're using at all times. And in the comics, the way they represent her luck is that she doesn't directly control her telekinesis. There is a subconscious thought in her brain that controls telekinesis to where when something bad would happen, like, oh my God, this driver's about to drive right into her. Her telekinesis moves that mirror right. and it's subconscious. I see. So it's not that she's evading every bullet because the marksmen suck at their jobs. They're not stormtroopers, right? Different universe. Like these guys can <laughs> shoot, but her telekinesis is just moving the bullets right. so that they just whiz right by her. So she's actually uh, another TK freak. Telekinesis in the biz. <laughs> Why don't they explain? Because I didn't know that. Why don't they explain? Or you have to you have to get in deep to get that. I mean, watch well, the movie again, and you'll see that like these things didn't just like like they're they're happening. They're they're physical manifestations. Like that mirror tilted. There was like how did it tilt? Right. Right. In the comics, they do explain it. Like in the early two thousands, I think. Or yeah, maybe- no, I was gonna say it took a while in the character's life before that story came out. And truth be told, I don't know that that was ever the original intention. There are characters in comics that have luck powers. They manipulate probability to their favor, you know, like, or, if, or they just have like, um, destiny or some right, kind of divineness, like how squirrel girl can't lose. <laughs> right. She wins all the fights, even when yeah. she shouldn't because what a dumb character. I'm sorry. She, she's got, she's got the ultimate level of plot armor. So, yeah, yeah. Sorry, we're we're going pretty deep yeah, on this, pretty, I guess. Like, I think when I think of like dumb night, Ant Man and Wasp, what's up with that one? Is that part of the same? Yeah, so that's it's in the well, MCU. That's Marvel universe. <laughs> that's like, Marvel, right? owned by Marvel, though. So, so well, what does it do with Ant? What I they they didn't make these people like Wasp is a real. Yeah, she's been around forever. She's, been around she's actually time. one of the uh, the Avengers like founding starting lineup of the oh, Avengers. Okay. So what's Thomas. crazy is like the the MCU has to go by that title because. They've deviated so far from the comics, but they do that because they knew that if they went with the original Avengers lineup with no setup, with, with terrible delivery, you're going to hit a small target audience and then the movies would have flopped. And I hate to say that, but you would put a lot of money into a pure, excuse me, pure product that would not have done as well and broad and a broad uh, audience. Kind of like the Justice League movie. Uh oh, shots fired. <laughs> well, well, he ain't wrong, folks. But more importantly, um, I think whoever it was, and it wasn't like Kevin Feige or like anybody specifically, but you know, everyone involved from the process of Iron Man with Robert Downey Jr. forward. When when Iron Man came out, they're like. We got this. Yeah. And they knew, okay, one character at a time, 
and we'll use a marquee person who has branding potential in their own right. And then they did their, you know, gorilla math. They bust out an abacus and they're figuring out their, their numbers for who can hold their own weight. Trust me, Wasp wasn't on that list. Like, yes, for the purists, it would have been great to see an original lineup. And at the end of Civil War, they kind of showed a different lineup to the Avengers when there was the split with Cap and you, you have like, you know, Vision and Falcon and a few others that, you know, have held that mantle at different stages. But true to form, no, they didn't. And that's because whatever executives were doing the numbers said, maybe there was like test groups, I don't know, but focus groups rather, but Wasp wouldn't have held that up. Mm-hmm. Now, introducing uh, introducing Hank Pym was hard because you really can't sell the sciencey type guy doing all this kick-ass stuff anymore. They failed miserably at that in the past, right? So, and, I, and I'm, I'm talking like, you know, other franchises like Reed Richards. Reed mm-hmm. Richards does not do a great job in, in film form as much as he does in comic book form. So even with Spider-Man, you had to like dumb him down a bit, make him just a really smart kid. Well, um, what's with them changing? Like, what's up with that? Well, what? Like wait, he's, wait, he's what's older, up? he's younger, and then he's totally different person like they well, they okay. understand they fucked up yeah like, is like that what it is? toby mcguire should have never been spider-man that that franchise has been in flux for a number of years but the, the most recent movies have brought like sony is working with marvel to create a single narrative so that's why um the most recent spider-man appearances have had Marvel's touch, the Marvel Studios touch, okay. and it all ties back into the main Marvel universe. You got to understand um, when Marvel was uh, was struggling back in the day, uh, they sold their film rights to a, a variety of their their most iconic characters. Okay, so Spider Man ended up in the hands of Sony. The X Men ended up ended up in the hands of Fox. Um, uh, the Fantastic Four. All all these characters ended up in the hands of other studios Uh, when they wanted to make films on their own and not rely on other studios to do it they only had a small pool of characters and those characters happened to be the while arguably a list in the marvel universe popularity wise the avengers weren't actually that popular people don't know at the time don't know them the same way as people know the fantastic four the x-men you know um so that's what they that's what they had left and that's what they focused on. And over time they've been trying to reacquire the rights. Sony wasn't about to just sell that shit back to Disney Marvel, mm-hmm. but they saw a fantastic opportunity to to make money by working with Marvel and Marvel had the opportunity to tell the stories they wanted. Huh. So it was a uh, mutually beneficial And there. Batman's the other side. Batman's yeah, a that's completely DC. different company. That's DC. That's DC. Yeah. Right. Now um, they did know, the same. They do, they're doing the same thing with him. I mean, well, they had you know, like all those different Batmans and such. Yeah. Well, it's also a large span of time that you're talking about at this point. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. There, there's going to always be a situation where people grow out of comics as you have new readers coming into comics, and you can't just have like the Peter Parker that came out you know, 60 some odd years ago would be an old man today if he aged in comics. So yes, you're going to have to do reboots. You're going to have to reshoot stories. Actors grow older in real time. So it makes sense in that respect. But you can't just, you can't just tell the same story again and again and again. Yeah. Like, I hate to, I hate to be all cheesy and whatnot, but you know, Disney's doing the Nutcracker as a movie. Mm -hmm. Guess what? It looks totally different. Right. Because if you tell the Nutcracker one more effing time, the same way, <laughs> I'm going to lose it. Right? right. But I mean, that's the point. We yeah. have a short attention span as pub- as the public goes, but we don't have um, bad memory. So in order to keep our attention, you have to excite us. But we didn't forget that bomb from before, so you better fix it. Or we remember the old story. So if you just regurgitate it, we're going to be pissed. Right. So yeah, they they do different interact- yeah. uh, inter- iterations. Um Am I going to sit here and say Christian Bell was better than Michael Keaton? No. Like you, you can you can wave whatever flag you want in terms of who your favorite Batman was. Right. But what I am going to say is those Christopher Nolan films were the most put together of any sequential Batman movies. 
he might not, Christian Bale might not have been the best Batman. Now, look, I'm going to tell you, I, I feel like he did a great job. And no one's going to deny that Val Kilmer was the worst, right? Right. <laughs> exactly. But. <laughs> that's so true. But, you know, Ben Affleck's trying. He's trying real damn hard. Oh, that's right. Ben Affleck was. Ben Affleck is I, yeah, twice. He's, he's the twice. worst. He's, he's trying the real hard. And if you're listening, Ben, you got to step your game up. Oh, Ben, he, well, he was also Daredevil. So it's so. You know, I don't and, like and, when they. And that's okay. Captain America was the Human Torch. Chris Evans was Human Torch and Fantastic Four. Yeah, you're Four. right. Yeah. He was. And he was actually a fantastic Human Torch. He was. Like, he was. Yeah. Like, like those films weren't good by any means, yeah. but but his, his no. part in it was excellent. No. That's true. But, you know. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to find creative ways of spinning those stories, and finding the right person to fulfill that role, and that's why they're gonna retell Batman. That's why they're gonna retell uh, Spider Man. You know, between any uh, any franchise, either camp, Marvel, DC. Um, I just heard that Jamie Fox got cast to be Spawn in an Image comic reboot of Spawn, and you know Michael Jai White was probably the best candidate they had at the time, but man, did that movie just suck. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what they could potentially do with Jamie Foxx. I know Jamie Foxx is Academy Award winning actor, but I just don't see him as Spawn. Right. But they're going to try, you know. And sure. and this is this is the game right now. The big blockbusters are comic book movies. Even people that are not comic book movie or comic book fans are going to see comic book. They movies. love that fantasy. They like yeah. the, the yeah, superhero and, fantasies. I mean, the, do you think we'll see a jujitsu guy as a, a superhero? I mean, technically, they, they, there are plenty of guys. Who? Well, like Batman does jujitsu. Does he? Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Batman's like Batman studies known, all kinds known, known of martial arts. Well, I mean, like Batman Not doesn't known. go around walking around in like a gi, like like he's got like five stripes <laughs> on his black belt right. or anything That's like that. That's what I want to see. I want right. to see that gi. Um, I want to see that. You know, uh, brought to you by Show Your Roll. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking I mean, sell out. Bruce Wayne. You know, he, he's got all the monies. He would probably actually have a very hard to submit. Gig. That's true. Very hard to submit. We're, <laughs> we're sponsored by them. So VHTS is awesome. You know, I talk about that brand even though I have had zero of their products. Really? I've got zero. a gi right there. You can check it out. Oh, man. dude. That's awesome. Um, unfortunately, that would be a conflict of interest. I'm I'm a lanky sponsored athlete. Love oh, lanky geese. Okay. It works for me and my body type. But I love the brand mainly because I think that name is kick ass. Yeah, like is. very hard to submit. VHTS. And I talk about it in my class. I was like, guys, if you're gonna come in wearing that gi, you better own it. Like <laughs> you better be that. Like tap tap tap, right. dude. We're two minutes into the round. Right. Get that gi. And turn it in. Right. Like, <laughs> so in, in that respect, Going it's like- Going forward, there will have to be a test before you can purchase no, more exactly. like, more like, okay, guys, that gi is off limits till you're a purple belt. Right. Like, <laughs> learn yo stuff. Well, Come back with that gi. Congratulations on your purple belt, oh, by the way. So, oh, awesome. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> Haven't yeah. had a chance to say it in person. Thanks. That's cool. But, um, and, uh, you know- <sighs> So, yeah, I mean, like, our-, our our listening audience obviously can't tell, but uh, David has a, a bit of a wingspan on him. So the, a little the, bit. Yeah, yeah, the I'm, lanky I'm, fight gear. You know, <laughs> I, I try not to talk about my genealogy too much, but uh, I'm part pterodactyl. Um, <laughs> goes, it helps. And the conversation that keeps coming up in, in recent memory is how, you know, people are trying to um, live this subculture that is now becoming the mainstream where they're like art is suave, the gentle art, and they're trying to be all like more art than martial in the martial arts. Okay. And it's like, dude, we got into this because we have this penchant for not violence, but controlling the violence. Yeah. And how do you control violence? Well, like in G.I. Joe, they would always say, and knowing is half the battle. Well, guess what? The other half is still violence. Yeah. So aggression, right? We have to we have to manage that. Now, if you're like Oh, technique wins against everything. Yeah, until somebody else has the equal amount of technique and then whatever else you bring to that fight will win. So if you have an attribute, whether it's speed, flexibility, strength, um, grit, you know, those things will win against an equally trained adversary. Like when I compete against another black belt, I hate to say it, but unless they're a specialist in an area where I am definitely devoid of that skill set, Skill didn't make them win. Skill didn't make them win. Like we we're evenly, you know, they, let me rephrase that. 
if someone is a specialist in an area where I'm weak, their skill won them that match. Right. But it's very rare to find people that are just like one trick ponies. At that level. At that level. Right. So when you encounter somebody and you're like, oh man, that guy's a physical specimen. I, um, I better find out where I can beat them because overall, if I try to fight them heads up in something that I know we're evenly matched at, I'm going to lose there. And you have to be real with yourself. You can't believe in this mysticism of, you know, the technique will win out on everything. It won't win on everything. It will win where you can, where there's a skill disparity. And, you know, my professor, uh, Master Pedro Sauer, who is most famously known for his uh, Gracie Challenge fights, and arguably the most famous was the one that was filmed in that basement way back in the day against Mr. Utah. And that was a pure size versus skill scenario where if Pedro didn't have the skill, he would lose to the size. But the other guy had no skill. Right. right? But the pundits will, will get out there and be like, but the guy didn't have any skill. No, listen, you fight that guy with your lack of skill and watch what happens. Right. He'll fold you up like an old wallet, right? But when you have Pedro showing like, hey, this stuff works, then you turn some heads and they're like, oh man, yeah, that's great. He had such a huge skill gap that the size didn't matter. Right, right. What would happen if, if, if Lance Bachelor had gone out that day and been like, fuck it, I'm learning jujitsu. Damn. Because last I checked, Who's winning like every heavyweight and ultra heavyweight jujitsu match? Is it like some sloppy dude? No, it's usually the guys that open up their gi and it looks like two turtle shells for pecs. Right. <laughs> like those are the guys. And I'm like, yeah, uh, Buchecha and Hodger, you know, when they had their second match, a lot of people like, yeah, and old school jujitsu wins. You don't think Buchecha knows that Hodger's going to do that stuff. And you don't think Hodger knows Buchecha's game? Like if you think Buchecha just sits there and does like 1000 cross chokes before he brushes his teeth and then he goes home and he just hits a sit up sweep and that's all he does. <laughs> you are an idiot. Right. If you don't think Buchecha has ever shut down a Barambolo, if you don't think he's ever like, like grip broke a worm guard, you're an idiot. The same way that if you don't think Buchechik went into that match taking Hodger seriously, ah, old school, whatever, I got this. Man, one mistake ended that match. You have two guys at equal skill. One guy has maybe a little bit more skill in an area. And if that guy slips and he's not going into it correct, then guess what? He loses. Now, what was the attribute in that fight? It was the focus. Hodger was way more focused. And Buchecha had a different attribute he was using, which was his size, right? His, his muscularity, his, his presence. But if you only rely on that attribute, you can also be using it as a crutch, right? Mm -hmm. Or sorry, let me rephrase that. If you use it as a crutch, it's bad. Right. You can't just say this attribute will hold. No, it is the, it is the kicker. So when the two of us go into it with our equal technique, that would be the thing that could win out. But if you're saying, this is what I have, and you're still not focusing on that technique, you lose because the other guy's attribute was his focus and he hit it better. So man, that was a classic match that usually puts people into like two very polarized camps. And then I'm sitting here on the side like, man, we got to analyze this. Sorry. Yeah, that's that was, just the way I work. It was a great match too. Yeah, for sure. But don't use it to fuel your argument. Right. Like, right. There's so much more going on there. Don't just take the, the victory or the result as this, well, this wins for the old school guys. No. You don't think Hodger knows like new school, quote unquote, new school jujitsu? Right. Get the hell out of here. Go to, go to England, train with the guy. I've got a guy at my uh, academy, Dan Bellows, who's a purple belt, who trained at Hodgers for an entire month and a half. He came back and was just slaughtering people with these spinning omoplatas and knee bars. When have you seen Hodger do that? Uh, never. Right. Do you think he doesn't know how? Right. Tell me. Right. We yeah we we've got a we've got a gentleman who comes through Chicago Excuse pretty me. regularly who's who trains with Hodger and you know like his game is not pure 
old school jujitsu. You know, he he knows yeah. he knows modern game. He, he knows plenty of that stuff. And you know, in talking to him about it, that's what they work in the academy. It's not like it's unfamiliar territory. Even if somebody has a strong preference, like you still have to know how to fight against it. You're still right. facing it in competition. Sure. So your competitors, even if they weren't learning it in the academy initially, they're gonna face it, possibly run into some problems with it, and come back and be like. I need an answer to this. Right. Yeah. You're going to lose a lot of students if you don't have some kind of answer to provide them. Man, and I, and I love when my professor, Master Sauer, teaches a class and he's like, okay, guys, so this guy tries a barren bolo. We're going to shut it down. And people are like, did he say the B word? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, guys, I know that we got Elio Gracie on the wall. Trust me, I got a tattoo of the guy on my back. I love what Elio Gracie did for the sport but he knew it wasn't finished. Is the Model T what we drive today? No. 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 Innovations happen, right? So uh, my buddy German and I, we were, when we were talking about this on the road trip, I, I equated jujitsu in a cross section, like as you look at the history of it, to a relay race with batons, right? Like one runner runs their leg of the sprint and then they pass it off to another runner. But when they do that trade, you can't come to a dead stop right where that other person is and then be like, here, there's got to be an overlap where the prior leg, which is the prior generation, runs into and up with the next leg, the next generation and passes it off. And they're going to coexist at that same speed for a little while to make the cleanest trade possible. Right. Now, the difference here is there are conflicts because there are opposing teams and everybody runs at different speeds and we're all trying to win this race. So why are the Donaher guys doing so well? They had an even trade. Like they, they traded that baton off so like precisely. Like Henzo, was Henzo known for his killer leg locks? No, no not at all. And then where did Danaher come from with his no competitions and just start teaching these leg locks? They found that it was better for them to run their race in their individual sections the best they could, but where they are beating everyone else is in how they have transferred that, that force, that forward momentum into the next generation, into the next generation. Why do you think Nikki Ryan is going to be a freaking killer? So if you use that analogy, you'll see where some people are stumbling, where some of these people that are like pro old school now have students that have the interwebs and all these magazines and all this material. And they're looking and they're like, why aren't we doing this? And they're like, ah, pfft, you don't need that. And now you're going to have a bad pass of that baton and there's going to be a gap. And now these people are going to struggle and they're not going to win the race. They're going to go to a competition. They're going to deal with somebody who's from a school that did have that really great transition into that next wave. And they're going to lose to that. And that person's going to be bitter and they're going to vilify their instructors and possibly jump ship. Now, I don't necessarily think that there are tons of Crayonche guys like running around, like doing all this stuff to get rank anymore. I think it's more people leaving their schools because they realize that that school is not doing them the service that they're paying for. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember as, as academy owners or instructors, we're, we're still a customer service industry. We're selling a good. The good is this martial arts. And if ours is not better than the competitions, then why are they going to buy from us? Right, right. That's it. It's very simple when you break it down. But to change the mind of a lot of old school guys, you're better off, you know, drawing blood from a stone. Yeah. What I love about Master Sauer, he's like, no, you guys got this. And he'll try some new stuff. And he, he, he appreciates the talent within that are advancing the art. And he forces a very simple thing at, at his um, association wide level. If you're testing for your black belt, you need to know the self-defense. Did I say you only need to know the self-defense? No. No. He just enforces that you have to know Elio Gracie's master text. He knows I do Darce chokes. He knows I do ankle locks. He knows I do all this stuff that is not even covered in that book. Nowhere in those 200 plus pages does it ever cover an Armin bravo style anaconda or bravo's type choke right that's it he doesn't doesn't cover it he loves that i do that move 
And he loves that I teach it and I share it to the next generation. And there's so much to be said about someone who has that open mind and is willing to go there. Now, what we need is for all, like if he's the general, all the lieutenants beneath him, like all the colonels, quote unquote, any rank Mm -hmm. beneath him, they need to also have that mindset where it's like, guys, you got to think, what do you want to leave doing? Do you want to do the same thing you've always done? Or do you want to make sure that we're progressing? Because- where's karate now? Right. Where's Kung Fu now? Now, why is Muay Thai sticking around? Why? They've got universal nomenclature, which Jiu Jitsu doesn't have. They've got universal nomenclature. They have uh, a pathway to success in terms of like uh, advancing in rank and advancing in competition. They have everything pretty much hammered down and worked out. And they know that as the fighting game gets a little bit more complicated, you adjust to the rule sets. If you go and fight here and you can't do this, cool, let's train for this. And they let the rule sets determine the skill sets. Whereas you'll get guys that are like, ah, forget that sub only stuff. That's for stallers. Or eh, forget points tournaments. Those guys are stallers. Guys, we're <laughs> saying the same thing. How about you just go out there and win more? Right. Like stop sucking. You need... You know what your defense needs? More offense. Yeah, Zito. Yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry, I just needed to shamelessly plug Cobra Kai. Damn, that show was good. <laughs> Wasn't it good? Oh, man. <laughs> Fuck, that was good. It, it was okay. a real life biography, or uh, it was like a, a behind the scenes documentary on what it is to be a, a gym owner. It, it really is. is. You're right. It was, that was like, so, like Paul hit me up. He's like, dude, did you watch Cobra Kai? I just watched it in like a day. I'm like, no, what? I, I didn't know where to find it. So then he's like, you gotta get like YouTube Red, I guess. Mm-hmm. So I bought it for not sure. Not Red Tube, not Red Tube. <laughs> <And> totally <laughs> Don't different. Don't mess that up. Don't fuck that up. Yeah. So I bought it, and I'm like, and I just fucking watched it here at the office. I'm like, I can't stop watching it. I my employees are like, two days. Do my employees are like, what are you doing? I'm like, you have never seen Karate Kid. They're like, no. I'm like, you motherfuckers you are messed so young. Up. Go yeah, watch gonna, it. I was gonna say, like Bruno probably no. hasn't seen the original he's Karate seen, Kid and at he's all. Still, and I tell him, I go, Bruno, did you watch Karate Kid this weekend? He's like, no. I'm like, would you fucking watch that fucking movie already? You're going to be very disappointed by his reaction if he does actually watch it. Maybe, not, no, maybe not. Maybe. It might not know. get to him the Listen, same way. Maybe. You I did the know. right thing, though. I did, right? But that same seminar that you know Jeff and I reconnected at when Master Hickson came through, the most important takeaway from his, from his seminar was not a technical piece of advice. I mean, he everything he does was gold. Everything he did, excuse me, everything he did was gold. There wasn't a single mechanic that was not impeccable and masterful. But when he said, and I'm paraphrasing, when he said, the guys my daddy fought, I could beat handedly when I was in my prime. Those guys were nothing to what I had to deal with. But the guys that Crone is fighting today would whip on me in my prime. Interesting. That is a clear cut example of the evolution of the art where a guy that we have, you know, put on a pedestal and we have like deified him as something above and beyond. He's just a man and he gets that and he knows where he ran his leg of that relay race. Right. And he is taking it upon himself to be that that middle ground where he's branching, where he's taking uh, what his father did and he's bringing it into the current generation but he's not like poo-pooing and sticking his nose up at what Crone has to do. Right. And when he, um, a year ago, I was at the Hickson Cup. Um, I won a gold medal up in Albany competing at his inaugural event, the first one he's had in years when he revitalized the Hickson Cup. So I uh, went up to New York, competed there, and I was also in the self-defense demo that started the day. So it's very similar to what uh, Master Hickson and Hoyler did at Pride, where they did that demonstration in the ring. Well, I got to do it with Pedro Sauer, and that was freaking awesome. (laughs) So that video is online for anybody interested, and it is killer. And you want to talk about someone who is like the man at doing that demo? Hickson crushed it. Him and Hoyler, they obviously know what they're doing, but but they did it in their prime. Watch Pedro Sauer throw me around a prime guy, like, and he's 59 years old. Right. Like that to me has a little bit more weight. Yeah. But once again, Hickson Cup. Um, I got silver in the gi, or sorry, silver in no gi, gold in the gi. 
before my before my gi match, I had a match against uh, Fabrizio Barbarati, and he hit me with a flying triangle. Now, per the rule set at the Hickson Cup, if I hold him in the position in the air above my head, and I have shown that I have um, neutralized any submission attempt, and for you know three Mississippi seconds or whatever have you, they have to, he has to let go of the move, start back on his feet, and I get two points. Wow. Because they don't allow up. slamming. They don't allow slamming out of submissions, but they don't want, they don't, and they don't shun flying submissions. Okay. But if you can show a controlled hold on a person and elevate them above your waist. So like if I had, if, if Javi had closed guard on me and yeah. I stand in his closed guard, right. that doesn't mean like we'll reset from standing. But if he has closed guard on me, I stand and I hike him up. He's still technically like on my waist. But now if he were higher, that could be a slam, right? Yeah. Like, And so the way they denote that was with this judging call where there's a pause, a reset, and points are awarded. So I'm in this match with uh, Fabrizio, and I hope I'm not butchering his name. The guy's Brazilian, Fabrizio Barbarati. He sounds like he should be an Italian opera singer. But <laughs> um, Fabrizio perfectly timed this flying triangle. But once again, I'm playing my skill set versus the rule set, and I'm like, cool. So I protect my arm. I don't let it go across my face. I hug his leg and I lift him and I keep him up in the air. And now I'm looking at the ref like it's the IBJJF. <laughs> like, okay, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three. And then I'm like, I, can't, I don't want to talk to the ref, but I'm like, like looking, what's up? What's up? He doesn't stop anything. Now Fabrizio reaches down, grabs my wrist, puts me in a Kimura and I tap. And I'm like, really? I almost would have rather have slammed him and gotten DQ'd. Right. Like, because now that's just bogus. Like, I'm looking at the ref, like, not fighting. I'm just playing to the rules. Was the ref Aaron Brooks? Oh, boy. <laughs> Shots fired. Shots fired. Man, use his middle name and address next time. <laughs> so, you know. Teasing Aaron. After that match, I'm pretty, I'm pretty ticked off because I didn't lose. I didn't lose because of anything other than me actually just playing to the rules. So I'm like, damn. That ref just completely screwed me. So I go, I go backstage to to get my uh, my gi on because I know I'm going to be going into the gi. I'm going to have a match with this same exact guy pretty soon. And when I was walking back there, it just so happened that where Master Sauer and I had staged our gear prior to the self defense demo before the whole tournament started is also where Hickson put his stuff. So I'm walking to the back with Hickson Gracie now. We get into the back room, and he's like, "Man, I just saw that match, and I want to apologize." I go, "You don't have to apologize for anything." And by the way, um, this this is a guy who does not want to be called Master Hickson or Grandmaster. He doesn't own slaves. He doesn't want to be called Master or anything. He just wants to be called Hickson, right? And out of respect, I'm still calling him Master Hickson because I don't want to be the guy that doesn't, doesn't right? <laughs> right. But he's like, just relax, just relax. And then he wants to talk to me about my match. So now we're sitting backstage from the event in a room where it's just me and Hickson Gracie. And uh, this is the this is my favorite part of the story. So then I'm eating Hickson's nuts, right? <laughs> um, he busted out a bag of trail mix and offered them to me. Right. Nice. So so there I am. His nuts in your mouth. Yep. <laughs> Salty. And I'm talking to him about a match where he agrees that the call was wrong, but he is the organizer, or sorry, not the organizer. He is the president of the Jiu Jitsu Global Federation, but he is not the head referee. And he is not an arbitrator in any match's decisions. Right. The tournament represents him, but he cannot get personally involved in matches. Sure. But he is telling me point blank, that match is bullshit. All right. And so without saying those exact words, he, he starts to give me some advice. And then I start to talk to him about, you know, a few things. And next thing you know, I'm having this beautiful, like 30, 40 minute long conversation with Higgs and Gracie, just like in a room, like a man, just wow. chilling off to the side. Um, in it, we had mentioned how an unnamed student of his who loves to do hidden jujitsu, um, uh, ripped one of my moves and sold it as his own. And then Hickson was like, yeah, I never taught him that, but you know, that's how this guy wants to market it. That's cool. Um, same guy who never returns my messages and whatever else. That's cool. That's fine. <laughs> you know, they say, uh, you know, the, the game gets harder as you get closer to the act boss. <laughs> you know, you're, you know, you're making it towards the end. Yeah. Well, quick aside inside a story, 
Uh, I have some signature T-shirts that Lanky Fight Gear produced that were like the mongoose fighting the cobra, right, Dave Porter, right. Lanky Fight Gear. Um, one of my students comes up to me Thursday night, <laughs> and he's like, dude, I haven't seen you forever. I was like, oh, yeah, how you been? Cool. Hey, you'll never guess the craziest thing happened. I went to a thrift store the other day. I found two of your signature shirts, two for $5. Uh. <laughs> and instead of getting mad, I was stoked because first off, it's great to have fans, but it's greater to have haters because <laughs> that means it's like a, it's you've broken through that ceiling and now you're in a different level different of level, success. Yeah. Right. Where even the guys that once liked you are like, man, that Dave Porter guy, I'm, I'm going to show him. I'm going to put these shirts into the thrift store. Well, first off, you already gave me your money. You bought the shirt. <laughs> right, so you're right. lost already. If, if you're now like the turncoat, you're like now rooting for LeBron James somewhere else. Great. Cool. Root, root for whoever you want. You already gave up the shirts. But now you're helping that thrift store because it's thrift store because they're going to sell them and make their money. Right. And now somebody who couldn't get that sold out shirt anywhere else for the exorbitant amount of money it was worth because it's Murakatsu artwork mm-hmm. now got it for five bucks, two That's for five. Awesome. Right. Dude, you did so much good. And you thought you were like, I'm going to show him. Right. And that, that is awesome. Alternately, so, somebody could have just broken up with their girlfriend and they're like, fuck all his clothes. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, don't you ruin my story. Honey. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll keep my possible reality out of it. Yeah. I, I know the narrative. <laughs> I know it. It's just, it's in me. I get it. But, you know, going back to the conversation with Hickson, we're, we're talking and I'm like, man, you know, it's crazy that. It's so, it's so simple in this art. We just have to, you know, work hard, go on the mats, and hope that nobody screws us. And if we put in hard work on a mechanic that we know we developed and we pushed further, all we ever hope for is that somebody uses it somewhere, and that if anything, they give credit where credit's due, or better yet, not take credit for somebody else's work. Right. Right. So. You know, for the longest time, I harbored so much ill will towards said unnamed hidden jujitsu guy for uh, <laughs> for stealing this mechanic and like saying, and I learned this from Hickson. But then when I'm backstage with Master Hickson and I'm on the ground now doing this mechanic and he's like, oh, this is phenomenal. I'm like, wow, you never showed this to him? He's like, no, I don't know this. And I'm like, vindication, <laughs> you know, like that's all I cared about. And then, you know, it's like, man, that night I went to sleep happy. Oh, sorry. By the way, I went back out to that Barbarati guy and I broke his foot. But anyway, um, <laughs> he should have known your defense. Well, you know, maybe if he was subscribed to a certain invisible, oh no, 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 sorry. Hidden jujitsu. Um, maybe he would have known, but the, the real joke is on that Barbarati guy, you know, he won on a technicality and then I won, uh, the real, what the real fight, you That's know, right. it's like you go out you, you might've got a submission on a guy who's like trying to fight within the confines of the rules. And now all you've done is piss off the lion. And I went out there, I put him in a toehold and, uh, man, like it, it was like, if I can, if I could figure it out, if I can uh, describe it well enough to any listeners, it would be similar to pouring a bowl of rice krispies saying, ah, screw the milk. And you just reach in with your hand and just grab all the Rice Krispies and crush it. (laughs) Like that was the sound his foot was making because I I don't like to just like put all five fingers on the, on the top blade and then fold the foot. I'm like champions of crush hand grip aid champion. Right. Mm -hmm. So I like use my thumb, fold the toes next to each other, curve all of them in until like the foot arches in a weird grotesque reptilian manner. And then I fold your ankle on top of that. Nice. I'm, I'm having a hard time envisioning this. Maybe you can demonstrate that later on Zito. No, no, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> yeah. I like the walk out of here. <laughs> aggressive pedicures done by Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you've competed, obviously, a lot. A like, lot, a lot. A, a lot, bit, a lot. A Are you the same weight as like, Hinger? Would you be the same weight as Josh Hinger? Uh, I think we are. So – that's kind of funny to me because I've competed at everything from 215 to 161. Oh, wow. Uh, when I fought professionally, sorry, let me, let, me, let me say this correctly. When I was fighting Muay Thai, amateur and professional, I went anywhere from the low 180s into the low 200s. Wow. Uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, I ballooned up to 215 and I was swole dog. 
I fucking hated it, by the way. It's just a miserable lifestyle when you have trouble to like scratch your lower back. Yeah. And it does no service to your jujitsu when you pack that much muscle on a frame that shouldn't support it. But um, I did compete a few times at 215 and it, it was actually like the worst showings I ever had. And I'm not prone uh, and I'm not against cutting drastically to the other as to the other side of the spectrum. Yeah. So like my body wants to be 185. Okay. So 161 was hard for me. I did that twice within the last um, year and a half. A match I had at Toro Cup with CJ Murdoch February of the year before. And then most recently um, this last year against Glayton Mello. So I cut down to the low 160s for both of those matches. And I'm 5'11". So 5'11", with the wingspan of a pterodactyl, cutting down to 161, it looked like I had escaped Birkenau. Yeah. Like, Jesus. it was not good. And my family and my friends, they they can see it on my face when I cut like that. And, you know, my size medium shirts are flapping in the wind. It's not a good sign. But I will go where the best matches are for me at that time. So if unless a better offer hits the table, my weight will fluctuate to meet that talent. I see. So 170 is where I think most people see my, my, my matches, like the Taza match. Even my two matches with Gordon Ryan were at 170. Knowing what Gordon is now astounds people. But you have to remember in 2015 and 2016, into 2016, he hadn't like ballooned up yet. Right, right. Like th we're talking the late stages of brown belt Gordon. So I competed against Gordon twice at 170. How was he at 170? killer i mean he destroyed me the 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 funny thing is like earlier today uh, my buddy german and i we were training and i'm doing moves that gordon did to me in one of my matches and i had just taught it at our academy you know two and a half years later yeah. and i preface it with guys you don't understand i'm showing you a move that beat me in competition and then people are like that's isn't that awkward i was like no if you're not learning from your losses you're a loser right right like right. You can learn from your wins, right? You should be learning constantly. I hate that, like, you win or you learn. It's like, no, you should learn or learn more. Right. And I really take that to heart. And it's like, man, that, that was so good. How did he do that? Oh, mechanically, it works like this. And then I took a seminar with Gordon, and he shows the exact way he beat me years <laughs> ago. Um, by the way, there was a secret group meetup that wasn't so secret because then it ends up being published on all the social medias. But um, Betty Broadhurst, the first lady of jiu-jitsu, as I like to call her, she competes, uh, I want to say it's either Master 6 or Master 7. Like, wow. she, she's she's um, a spry lady. She she gets up, she goes to jiu-jitsu, she hangs out with all these people, like one-third her age, and she puts in the work. She runs her own organization called Roll Forever, and it's really cool, like two crashing waves and the sign of like an infinity symbol. It's got a real good Thulsa Doom-esque feel to it. Nice, right? And uh, and I, and I really enjoy uh, supporting Betty to the best of my ability. And Betty, in turn, just spends all of her time and energy supporting the jujitsu community. And she'll pull out all kinds of talent to come do seminars. And her and um, uh, Gordon Ryan's mom are really good friends. And just just randomly, or no, like no, a by design, road? by okay. design. Like Betty is always in the mix with all these jujitsu events and through just interactions yeah. befriended uh, Gordon Ryan's mom. And so now the two of them get up to no good all the time. <laughs> and when Gordon was in uh, Espoo, Finland for ADCCs, she went to, she went to Finland. So there's Betty Broadhurst hanging out with the Ryans. And she was there at the podium when Gordon got his gold medal in his, in his weight class and silver medal in the absolute. Yeah. So Betty is really tight with the family. So she most recently had, because there's no secret that Gordon is now training for the Gi. Mm -hmm. Well, you know that cross training makes us all better, right? Like if you just work with the same people all the time, you all get accustomed to everybody's little like tics and mannerisms. Of course, right. Yeah. So you want to inject a real adrenaline shot to that cross train. Well, what's better than cross training with a bunch of people that are specifically gi known black belts, you know, and definitely far away from you. So when Gordon came into town in, and when I say into town, I mean, I drove five and a half hours to Raleigh, North Carolina to go to Gracie Raleigh, where a bunch of black belts were told you should come here and train with Gordon Ryan. And it's like, you don't say no. Mm. 
And even still, with the number of people that could have been there, I was surprised that it was like only seven of us. Hmm. And three of whom, let me, let me quickly recall, only three of whom were black belts. And then there were a few brown belts and then like a purple belt. It's like, damn, this is who showed up. Why are you guys scared? Get your butt beat, learn. Right. But also he's learning too. Right. So like Gordon and I are going through it and man, it's just like feeling what it was like to grapple him at the finals of finishers one. And like, we had both won all of our matches. We get to the finals and I had like, I didn't steamroll the competition, but neither did he at that time. But then to get to that point and lose to him. And I was like, damn, he was 100% better than everyone else. Yeah. And then a month later to grapple him again and just get hosed even harder. I was like, wow, this kid is learning and he's just improving constantly to feel Gordon at 230 pounds. And I was maybe 180. No, no, no. Sorry. I apologize. Uh, I was coming back from my weight cut to 160. So I think I was 170. So Gordon has 60 pounds on me. And he was, relatively speaking, doing whatever he wanted. And he tapped me many, many times. But there were certain aspects of like that role where I'm like, damn, like, I think I should be getting the better of him because this is like my my terrain. This is some gee stuff that I know he he's not necessarily known for. What was he tapping you with? Uh, I mean, he was still getting to the back. Like Gordon's back takes sure. are. But he wasn't using like cross collar chokes. He wasn't using no, the gee no. in, in so, the yes, traditional sense. Well, yes and no. He wasn't using the gee for his attacks, but he was using it to manipulate everything he wants to control the body. So like. His Toriando step over pass was like brilliant, like what I would consider expertly timed for a gi player. Right. And he's doing this as new kid on the block. Right. And I don't want to give away too much from that session because it was very private. But I'm just going to say that if anybody is sleeping on Gordon's gi game, they're going to be in for a rude awakening. And he's still doing the things that he's known for now, but that was already months ago. So not that I'm spilling any beans, but wherever he's at now is further than that. Right. I know it is. And I can say that with like deathly certainty in my eyes, he is going to destroy the gi world. And when he puts on those social media posts saying, you're all fucked, I believe him. Wow. And this isn't me tooting my own horn saying, man, he beat me up, so he must be good. No, he's handedly beating up everybody that was in that room. And a lot of those guys I respect. And I'm like, man, these guys are great. What goes above great? Right. So um, there's a lot that goes into it, but man... Uh, I've competed at a lot of different weight classes. I've had a, uh, just under 250 competition matches or super fights. My win percentage isn't the greatest, but man, I'm happy with it. You know, like 75% or uh, my, my phone's outside, but I think it's 77% I win, but it's those 77% that I'm proud of because 98% of those are by submission. Wow. I've and, won. Oh, hold on. I like, I know a lot of guys that throw out numbers, you know, like, ah, oh, you know, I, I finished the whole plot up 45% of the time or something. No, no like, let's explain this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm a data junkie. Okay. So for me, I need to quantify everything. I need to have empirical information and I write everything down. Okay. So when I train, I go home and I, if, if I only have my iPhone or my iPad or a notebook, whatever the medium is that I'm using, I read in there and then I transcribe everything eventually over to an Excel spreadsheet. Wow. And okay. I have all of my formula input where I plug it in and all the math is done. And then I have the actual number of how successful I am with any given thing in a training environment. And if I go to competition, it's a new tab with different numbers wow. and down to the number of times I've done like, I don't know, like a balloon sweep. Like I could tell you that. I can tell you every time I've ever done a knee cut pass on my left non-dominant side. Come on. Dead serious. Damn. So <laughs> in uh, out of 167 victories by submission, uh, you know, there are only two other victories I've ever – or sorry, let me rephrase that. There are 167 total victories. 163 of them are by submission. Four are by – a mix of two by points, two by referee's decision in 14 years of competition. I've only ever gone to the referee and won by those four times, 
four times in that many years. And I've been beaten plenty of times, plenty of times. But it's like where the difference is that that percentage is split. And more than 50% of the time I'm losing by points or a referee's decision. Okay. Less than 50% of the time when I'm being submitted, it's by the guys like Gordon, Taza, yeah, yeah. Stanley Rosa, like uh, Nick Ronan, who's now just getting like some steam behind his name. I lost to him before it was cool. Like, <laughs> you know, like these guys are great. And then they all have one thing in common. It's funny how the guys that are submitting me with some kind of regularity are from like GF team, like Ataish Rafael, um, or the guys from the Donahue Death Squad. Yeah. Why? Well, let me be very, very honest. They have the team support for it. When you walk into a room and your training partners are like Eddie Cummings and Gary Tonin, you're going to be better off than me when it's like, hey, random purple belt, let's work. All right. You're just going to have more resources. Now, this isn't me saying that if I had like, and I'm going to name drop like Isaac Dodeline, like guy that everyone should know, um, you know, Cobrin one of Cobrinia's black belts who's competing at Spider and some other like big name events. Guy is a killer. If I worked with a dude like that every day, I am certain I would be doing some magical stuff. Um, but I just don't have those resources. We don't have, we have a lot of black belts at the Pedro Sauer headquarters, but not a lot of black belt competitors. And we know that there's a, a, a definite difference and I'm working with limited resources and still doing relatively well. I see. Um, at fight to win pro I'm Owen three now, but all of my losses were by referee's decision. So between guys like Daniel Tavares, who's been a black belt longer than I've even done jujitsu. Couldn't finish me. Uh, Dylan Royce, Ty Murphy, all these great guys, man. Th they're killers. And I'm not saying that from the Elio Gracie standpoint of, oh, you must survive. But I'm like, I never felt like I was going to get submitted by these guys. Right. They're great. But it's like, man, I, I just need more time or I need a different rule set or, man, maybe I could do X move or what if it were Nogi? And I'm like, man, I go home and I think, no, I know why I'm not. I'm not getting that extra edge. Every single one of those guys has the resources to get that W. Like they're they're definitely putting in enough work. Like they're they're getting they're getting what they need to get that nod from the judges. And I know it's because of who they can work with. Um, so my advice to any students or anybody listening, if you're thinking about how you can up your game, obviously like go to seminars, learn from the best, but you also need good training partners. Right. Um, I, I tell my students this all the time. We have uh, about 370 students at our academy and I will roll with every single one of them. There's nobody there that scares me. There's no boogeyman on the mats right. and I don't care. That's like, that's not a worry of mine, but I will only drill moves with three people. Okay. And the reason for that is as a black belt competitor who, who knows a lot of moves, I can't spend my drilling time teaching somebody how to do the move. I can't waste my time with somebody who's going to have ego and I can't also waste my time with somebody who's not going to give me the appropriate response right. because we need to get this done. And unfortunately, the air is thinnest at the top. So you have lots of white belts at the bottom, a little bit less blue, purple, brown, and then black. So there are very few people that I have at my disposal for my drilling time. And when they say drillers make killers, I fully believe it. You are only going to have the technical ability to start manipulating a move if your drilling time is there. And as I was telling the group earlier, uh, when I was hanging out at 10th planet, it's like, if you want to initiate a move or you want to get your timing down, roll more rolling is how you get your timing. You want to get into the, the thick of the movements you need drilling. Right. And if you're failing at the end, it's it's a problem with your safeties. Like we talk about redundant safeties, your ability to maintain that movement. And that's where you have to do your positional sparring with bad position yeah. so that you know, like you have a faulty armbar and you've got to reverse engineer it. And when you do that diagnostic work, you're then going to make the real magic happen. So I wish I can like wave a magic stick, go back, tell the younger me what resources I needed to use then when I had them because right, right. I don't anymore. But man, there's so many things that people can do nowadays to get that. And most of it, cross train. Right. So if, you, if you're in an academy where they say you, you can't cross train, uh, you're a student that pays to be there. You'll do whatever the hell you want. Yeah. 
Like it shouldn't be a cult. No instructor should ever tell their students like, this is, this is how it is. This are the highway. Cool. There's more schools. Like I'll go. Um, now in terms of like moral fiber and like stuff like that, you, you would hope your instructor is just a good person. And even if they do their best to act that way, when they start making those crazy, like culty demands, like, man, I don't buy it. I think that there's better stuff out there and you owe it to yourself to get on the same sheet of music with your instructor where you agree on the majority of the topics. You don't have to agree on everything, but man, it shouldn't be like their way or the highway. Right. And that's how people will, will benefit the most. But enough about me. <laughs> Actually, I was just going to get into more about you. Yeah. But yeah. Go ahead, huh? Well, no, I was going to say, now you said you've been competing jujitsu for 14 years. Yeah. You know, I, I refresh my memory here. How long have you been involved in martial arts period? <laughs> oh no. my God. Uh, so I started training in 1988 in, uh, a form of like American kickboxing. How old are you in 1988? Five. Damn. Yeah. You're, all, you're well, never mind. I'm not going to say the next thing. I'll get sued. But anyway, <laughs> I, I look younger than I am, I guess. But the, uh, the big takeaway is my mother did martial arts, but was also, um, you know, she was the victim of many, many an abusive boyfriend over the years. And so she felt it was, it would behoove her to also make sure that in addition to defending herself, like her kids understood the value of self-defense. Okay. Well, her, her friend and one of my eventual instructors, Brian Trafford got me involved in like Aki Kempo, uh, Muay Thai or sorry, Americanized kickboxing. And then through the years I dabbled in other things. So Around 13, I did a different form of karate and then ultimately a form of Kung Fu. When I was about 17, I got involved in Muay Thai and, um, or sorry, backtracking, got involved in Muay Thai around 10, around 17, I started competing in it actively as an amateur. By the time I was 18, I went pro all this while being uh, a senior in high school. And then through my college years, kept fighting actively and then, uh, found my way into uh, cross training with some guys like I, I went through like Vegas, uh, Extreme Couture, like Team Quest actually in that era. Back in those days. Back yeah. in those days. And, you know, just seeing a lot of people that were getting into MMA and MMA was still such a small niche crowd. And I was there at ground zero when that turning point happened where as I was making the leap into doing amateur MMA instead of pro kickboxing, it's like, man, how do you give up money? Like <laughs> amateurs don't get paid. Like you, you make that switch because either you want to do it or you have faith that it will eventually pay off. Right. And I was making that jump. And I remember, uh, 2005 hearing about some open casting call for some crazy reality show that the UFC was going to put on. And nobody believed it was going to come to like, nobody thought it was going to do anything big. Like I was there when tap out the series was happening and it was a joke, right? Like I was there when a few other things were happening and they were jokes, but then this is happening and people are like, man, you, you better watch out for this. And it's going to be on like a syndicated network. Like, Oh my God. And sure enough, right? Like the day after UFC premiered with the ultimate fighter on spike TV, man, everybody all of a sudden knew what UFC was. Right. I remember getting like, um, the Mark Coleman, uh, Williams fight on VHS. <laughs> and I also remember like my mom getting, or back in the day, sorry, it was my, my mom and my, my stepdad getting uh, free tickets from a radio station for calling in on mother's day for having the world's most rotten kids. Like we won that. <laughs> what up? <laughs> so where did they get, where did they send us to a UFC screening party? <sighs> Cause we're terrible kids. Right. So I remember seeing UFC as like a young man being in the martial arts and like being one of those fans that knew of the sport and knew what it was about. I knew who the Gracies were. I didn't pronounce it as Royce Gracie. Like I knew what I was talking about. Right. And then in 2005, being an adult who's had 10 years of exposure to that, to that brand and the sport, then seeing it hit TV, like public TV. And next thing you know, like every big bro at the gym is like, I'm going to be in the UFCA. And it's like, dude, you don't even know what you're talking about. 
And that was where the silver age of MMA took place, where now you have more people talking about it. It's becoming more mainstream. Right. And I don't even know how many people even remember that that Ultimate Fighter show that first season had guys like doing chariot races with Randy Couture on a beach and like weird obstacle courses. And it was a spectacle. Yeah. It was nothing like come in, work hard, train, fight. Right. But I mean, that first season, it did enough to get it to the mainstream. And now everyone knew about it. And now you couldn't go like, and then remember, like I went into the Marine Corps shortly thereafter. So then I start seeing like every F F 150 truck with a big, like stack in the back tap out sticker right on the back. Yeah. Dude walks out affliction t-shirt and it's like, fuck man. Now it's everywhere. everywhere. And then around 2009, it was like, it hit critical mass. And then we started getting into like, all right, now we have a different set of people like Anderson Silva was still the champ. Some other things were changing, but for the most part, it was really steady. 2012, oh my God, we're going to have a women's division? I was in Afghanistan and I found out that Ronda Rousey was going to be fighting uh, Liz Carmouche, who just fought tonight, mm -hmm. uh, was going to be fighting Liz Carmouche for the inaugural title. I was like, damn, you know it's mainstream when women are now in the UFC. All right. Now, understand that in 2005, I was fighting on Ring of Combat in the single digits. It was Ring of Combat 8. Wow. Right. They're up to like what? Ring of Combat like 70 something now? I'd have to look it up. Yeah, I don't know. But man. I remember Frankie Edgar's pro debut. <laughs> wow. Frankie Edgar pro debut, Ring of Combat 9, October, uh, I want to say it was October 28th, 2005. Wow. And Frankie Edgar destroyed that night and ultimately went on to have a very successful career right. in the UFC. Um, beating BJ Penn, you know, all that stuff. But that same exact card in 2005, BJ Penn, Uriah Hall, um, Philippe Nover. Um, geez. I, I just remember like going back on like looking on SureDog at who else was on that card. And I was like, man, was I the worst person who fought that night? <laughs> like everybody else went on to have like these crazy successful careers. And I'm like, damn, like Uriah Hall, Frankie Edgar. Philippe Nover, like all these guys either went on the ultimate fighter, won the ultimate fighter or won a strap. And then I'm like, yeah, well, I guess I'll go over here and work on my verbs. <laughs> like, what do you got coming up? Anything, man? I got, I got so many things I want to do. I want to do the finishers event, uh, in August. There's uh July 28th, us grappling. I love supporting us grappling. I feel like they have the fairest rule set. What's and, their rule set? Um, so they do a lot of submission onlys, but they also do a points tournament. Uh, they give a lot of time for black belt matches. They give 10 minutes for black belt matches. They allow, um, for lower body extremity locks. They allow straight ankle lock, knee bar, toe hold, calf slicer, and twisting variations on the ankle lock, uh, like, uh, esteema locks and stuff like that. They allow all that stuff. They just don't allow heel hooks in the gi. In terms of upper body submissions, you can do anything, including, um, uh, or, or sorry, everything excluding like uh, a spinal manipulation or a neck crank. So okay. you can't do a twister in the gi, but you can do just about everything else. Yeah. No can openers, obviously. No can openers. Yeah. But like for black belt, man, it's like you have so much freedom there and it's great. And in addition to that, like their refs go through a strenuous, uh, training process that I myself have gone through on three occasions to nice. be a ref for that organization. So I know that they're competent and they know what they're doing. Do they come to Chicago that they have been to Chicago in the past. Okay. Now here's why they don't anymore. Okay. Uh, there was a bit of a problem with securing locations. Okay. And then on top of that, they, the organization is made for grapplers by grapplers. But what they don't say is that if they put out flyers and they try to send them to local gyms and those gyms don't hang them on their walls and talk about the event, who's going to show up? Right. So when you have an organization that's based out of Richmond, Virginia, traveling to Chicago, and then there's like 200 competitors, that sucks, man. This is Chicago. Like you should have tons of people showing up. Right. There should be 600 competitors. Yeah. There's no reason why they can go to Virginia Beach and have 800 people in the door in Virginia Beach. And then come to Chicago, a mega metropolis, and be like, mm, 200 people. Right. Now, is that on them? No, that's on the academies in this area that know the event is coming to town and right. not pumping out the word. Right. When I teach my classes, I start my class by lining everybody up and I tell everybody current events. This is what's coming on uh, seminar-wise, tournament-wise, 
um, closures for the academy. I give them all the news. We bow in, we do our warm ups, we do our drills, we roll, we do whatever, line these guys up. Guys, in case you came in late or you didn't hear me before, this is what's going on. Right. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. You guess what? Our team shows up in force. We go out. We know these things are happening. We go to seminars as a team. That's it nice. doesn't matter if the, the seminars are 50 50. With, when Riley came out, we had five or six guys from our academy show up to Riley's seminar. Mm -hmm. well, now, for a seminar like that where there's 40 people, it's like, holy cow. Like we had 12% of the overall right. attendance of the, right. of the thing. Sorry, numbers. <laughs> but uh, point being, my, my biggest takeaway is you get, you get great events all the time, but you got to do your own research if your instructors aren't giving you the word. Me, I'm real, I got my finger on the pulse. So I'm talking to like um, uh, Marco Suarte and Abraham Awad, the guys with Show the Art, constantly. Um, in fact, Abe is going to be staying at my house next weekend and we're going to do some jujitsu and we're going to make with the struggle snuggles and face hugs and then film some stuff and have a blast. Nice. And then I'm going to try to get on his event, uh, August 11th. There's a potential that if that doesn't happen, it's because I'll be out in Bellingham, Washington, just North of Seattle for pajama murder camp. It is a group of guys getting ready for master's worlds. Okay. And it's just a six day immersion camp with the guy who runs dirty white belt radio, Jeff Shaw. Uh, otherwise known as my favorite random brown belt. Uh, Jeff, who is a plant-based warrior and awesome human being and dog lover, is running this camp legitimately like in his backyard, but has tons of ability to host this thing. He'll have people staying at his twin houses that are like on his property and he'll be cooking all these meals and just nice. getting people on the mats. And he's invited a who's who's list of like everyone from like Dominica Oblecha, like black belt world champion multiple time Marcelo yeah. Garcia uh, black belt to um, Mauricia Mar uh, from Admar Barbosa's <laughs> I think I said it right I'm, I'm in black no position belt, to correct you black belt champion um, you know a uh, bunch of bunch that's, of guys from like awesome. Robert Drysdale black belt Cody Malte a few other guys and so we're gonna get together and uh, strangle each other in pajamas for a week and so we call it pajama murder camp so that might come up um, also there's a U.S. grappling in Philadelphia in August. There's a U.S. grappling sub only in Raleigh in August past that into September. I don't usually look that far ahead unless it's a super fight, yeah. but tournament wise, those are some things on the pipeline for me. Nice. Um, my knee is a little shot at the moment, so I've got to really weigh into whether or not those are worth doing. Now, I, you said you're going to take stem cells. Yeah, man. Where you get those at? Uh, you know, just around the corner. Is that right? Crazy Billy Ray and them. No, uh, hey man, want to buy some Sims? Yeah, right. Yeah, I got this little fetus and an umbilical cord. <laughs> so they're gonna have you had it before? No, okay. And uh, I did a lot of research into it because I didn't want to get surgery. Surgery would keep me off the mats for about six weeks to three months. Wow, and that is like a death sentence to a guy that makes his living off of private lessons and seminars. So for me, doing jujitsu full time, I need to still be full time somehow. Okay, so uh, I saw the stem cell thing would be a quicker turnaround, yeah, but with that comes the the risk of it might not working of course. and because it might not work and my insurance doesn't cover it that could be forty five hundred dollars down the drain right. is that what is a shot uh yeah so for for this particular thing i know people that have had it in their hip and it might change in value depending on where you go but uh -huh. for where i live in northern virginia with the area in which i am getting it uh localized into my knee that was the price that i was given how, how does that work because I'm always interested in fixing my body because I got you know aches and pains yeah. in here and there. I'm yeah. just thinking cocaine is a hell of a drug. Is it? <laughs> it's fucking awesome. Yeah, it's more we can get that in Chicago pretty easy. Uh, yeah, I feel yeah. like that actually is available. That's on available a street on street corners, and it is Billy Ray. <laughs> so, <laughs> so crazy Billy Ray. Is it something that you went you went to the place and you're like, okay, listen, just shoot me there, or do they have to do some type of test to prove that you are a candidate for it, or how well, does that work? So there was a lot that went in um, because of my. Uh, service related injuries through the military. I've got VA uh, coverage on some things, yeah. but when I tore, when I hurt my knee, I initially got an X-ray. Okay, nothing's broken. Next step, MRI. Got an MRI. Here's the word. Okay, what are my options? I was given two cruddy options, so I was like, "Screw you guys! I'm gonna find another option." And I saw, and I found out that this is something that can be done. 
um, reached out to the people that are doing it. And I said, here are my MRI results. Looking at this, do you think your treatment would help me? Right. And they were like, more than, more than enough. Wow. So they're going to um, go into my hip or my shoulder um, and draw out some bone marrow. Then they're going to use that, uh, wave a magic stick and cultivate some stem cells. Okay. And then after a little while of that doing its thing, they're going to then pump those into the area of my knee and then let that either like, I, I guess, uh, take on the shape of the rest of that tissue and heal that site. Yeah. So in the case of like the partial tear, it'll just like fill in that good gap. Um, like, uh, like just piecing itself in like a puzzle yeah, piece. Yeah. And then in the case of like the frayed aspect of my uh, meniscus, it'll like coat that and then seal it shut. And then it will be back to its normal shape and keep its form. Wow. So yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be wild if it works. Let me know how that turns out. Yeah. And you know, like Fuck. 40, <laughs> 40, 40, $4,200, $4,500. I figure even if it fails, I've made worse decisions in my life for more money. Like I was once married. I made, I paid a, $5,000 tag on an engagement ring. Like well, that was a waste. <laughs> so whatever I've done worse. Yeah. No, I hear you. That makes sense. But yeah, I'm my shoulder, my knee. I'm just like, uh, yes, how's the wife? How's the kids? How's the shoulder? How's yeah, the knee? Right. <laughs> just come on. Let's get this shit and fixed we're back. up. Right. <laughs> Are you going to show some technique tonight? Do you have time for that? Yeah, I can definitely show, show some technique tonight. Where do you want to do that? And how we've got the gym next door. We got the like, 900 square feet of mat cool space. so we'll cut this we'll go over there we'll make with the struggle snuggles and yeah. we'll share that yeah mm -hmm. deal what do you want to say whatever you want to show darsh jokes <laughs> Ugh. you definitely want to feel this okay <laughs> no i'm saying like i'll show you whatever you want like i no, don't I'll, care i don't whatever. care if it is my my quote-unquote namesake but you know i'll show you anything you want okay cool yeah all right you want to wrap this up yeah let's let's Right. Wrap Let's it let up, you B. ask the standard questions, I guess. Yeah. Uh, where can people find you? <laughs> On the corner with Billy Ray. Yeah. Getting them stamps. Uh, so I'm in Herndon, Virginia at 360 Herndon Parkway, One Spirit Martial Arts, which is the official headquarters of the Pedro Sauer Association. Um, don't try to find out where I actually live because I am just at the academy all the time. <laughs> and what's your handle like on Instagram and Facebook and all that fun so stuff? So you can find me on Facebook, David Porter. I don't have an athlete's page because I don't believe in them. Uh, and by the way, if you're a blue belt and you have one, I hate you. Uh, <laughs> <Damn>. On <laughs> You have done nothing yet. Um, and on Instagram, the only other social media that I actively use, I am Dave Darce. So at Dave Darce, super original, and you can find me there. Um, if you're trying to find me on Pokemon Go because you want to do trades, I am in-game David Porter. I don't use an alias because I ain't afraid of no nerds. <laughs> what are I just they going to do? Beat me up? I got I got to chime in here. So, um, so Pokemon Go added a friend feature. And what uh, the fuck are you saying? Pokemon? Are you really saying this? Yeah, yeah. This is real. This is real. Okay. So, so you you're aware of what a Pokemon is, right? I mean, I didn't Kinda. live in that generation, but I've heard of it. Okay. okay. So. So we're just before my time, me, or it's me, after my let time. Let me give you the, like the Cliff's Notes version here. Please, please. So there is an app available oh. on Android and iPhone that is <laughs> called Pokemon Go. It lets people. It is an augmented reality game. Yes, where there is a map overlay. Yeah, I heard this came out. City. This came out years ago. Where Two you collect, years ago, you collect yeah. like uh, yeah. characters, right? Kind of. Okay. Yeah, one hundred and five weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> of course, numbers. You knew that. July seventh. 2016. Beautiful. There you go. So my 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 youngest son is very much into this game. My okay. wife plays it with yes. him. And uh, upon them adding the this friend feature where you know like you can connect with people through social media yeah, yeah. and trade and, uh -huh. and whatnot. I'm like, oh, you know, like my friend Dave. You know, re remember like when I was out in Virginia, we were doing some Pokemon Go stuff. I got you some some stuff on my phone. Da 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 da. Yeah. You should friend request it. Uh -huh. So. Uh, my wife friend requests him. They, she she see, you get to see the person's avatar and okay. like their collection of Pokemon and whatnot. Nice. And my son sees Dave's character for the first time, and he goes, oh, "He's got a Mew! Oh my god, he's amazing!" <laughs> and therefore, in my household, Dave is now known as 
the amazing Dave Porter. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> impressive. And if only they knew like my, my, my jujitsu was better. <laughs> <laughs> I am a, I am a peasant in the Pokemon go world. <laughs> so funny. Well, Dave, I really appreciate your time, man. And, cool. uh, I hope to get some rolls in, man. Let's yeah, do Anthony. Some, let's we'll, do some we'll, we'll, put, we'll put some work in real quick. Sweet. I'll dig it. Cool. All right. Thanks for having All me. Right. We'll see you guys. Bye. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Very Hard to Submit. Go to VHTSNY.com and check out their kimonos, compression gear, and apparel. This is a brand we are excited to be supported by. Their gear is high quality with a clean design. Go to VHTSNY.com and see for yourself. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. For more information about Grappler Union Podcast, you could visit us at our website at grapplerunion.com. You can follow us on Instagram at Grappler Union. Please like us on Facebook. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes. And all of our episodes are available on our YouTube channel. Say what? Be sure, be sure to subscribe. Yeah, subscribe to all that shit. <laughs> um, you got to do another take, right? Oh.